Good morning and welcome into this Monday morning here on Herd Out Sports Radio. I'm Ravi Lula, Avery Howard in with me this morning. Avery, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. can I can, can hear, hear you. Yeah, okay. I think we're good. I'm good. I'm good. We were talking about getting in cold cars this morning. Not excited for that necessarily yet, but... You know, it's kind of weird we because I don't like winter. Mm. I don't like cold weather. Hmm. I love jackets. You know I, what? That's a fair statement, actually. I love I actually can agree with that. I, I didn't know where you were going at the end there, but I was like, I actually can agree with that. It's it's one of the probably more ridiculous things about me. Mm-hmm. I have so many jackets and coats. Sweatshirts is a major lot of hoodies for me. A lot yeah. of hoodies for me as well. I love as I love fall and winter clothing. Yeah. I hate cold weather. Mm, okay. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I get it. But when I got to break out my bomber jacket today, uh, I was very excited. Okay, yeah. And then cool. I actually got outside and it was still cold. And I was like, mm, mm. Less, less excited. This isn't I like favorite. the idea. I don't like the action. <laughs> yes. It's like I yeah. actually like wearing it, but mm-hmm. I wish when I put it on, it still yeah. felt like summer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I look cool, but the reason for it, I'm I'm out. Don't love it. Yeah. Also, jackets aren't like magical. So it's not like, oh, it went 30. <laughs> now I feel like it's 65 degrees outside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That would, if they made a jacket like that, I would, I'd certainly be on board. But I once saw something that like you could get. Um, like one of those, it's like a heated blanket, but in a jacket, you know, yeah, like a, whatever. It's got like the batteries and yeah. stuff in it. It's scary a little bit. Yeah. I'm, but I kind of would vibe with it a little bit. Yeah. Like if I was on a sideline, potentially. Oh, for sure. But then I also need it for like, I need a shoe with that. <laughs> you need the, you yeah, need like toe a warmers shoe. don't do the thing for me. <laughs> no, they don't at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a little terrified of those, of the heated jackets. Yeah, I don't really know how I feel about a battery in my jacket. Like I that. feel, well, cause not just the battery, right. But I'm afraid that the little packets or whatever would burn me. Yeah. And like, I'm not a, like, it's yeah. like, I, I think I'll just be cold. I'm yeah. Not, it's not worth it. Yeah. I'm sure they've worked out the technology, but I'm not ready for it yet. It's mm-hmm. not, uh, it's not part of my, it's not part of my plans in the immediate future. Plus yeah. they haven't it's made flickering. them look like cool yeah. enough looking yet. Like I need the jackets. If the jackets look, look better, yeah. then I would probably take it back. Like, yeah. I'll get burned. It's not a big yeah. deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, more of the story. It was good, good, doing good this morning. Good, yeah. good, yeah. It's a little chilly out, but we're okay. We we're got good. the uh, yep. got the heat pumping here at uh, Heard at Sports Bar and Grill, um, and I I think everything's okay. It doesn't yep. smell like anything's burning anymore, nope. so that's nope. a plus. Yeah, you know, there's always like it, when you turn your heater on for oh, the yeah. first time, it always uh, smells like. Uh-huh. God, I hope I'm not burning my house down right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's we had a little bit of that this morning, but okay. I think we're okay. Yeah, yeah. Hot glue guns off. Yes, I think I think the craft store is closed. We're good. <laughs> yeah. It does like very much take me back to like my mom making little crafts uh-huh. and stuff. It's yeah, it's a very it's a potent smell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, but no, we're here at Herdout Sports Bar and Grill, the H and H Chevrolet stage, and we're powered by Cornhead Lager, the official beer of the 1890 Initiative, helping Nebraska football with their NIL contributions every beer you drink from cornhead longer lager responsibly uh goes to support the 1890 initiative and therefore husker football we i'll are, take it we appreciate uh their support as well coming up on the show today uh, it's going to be obviously pretty college football heavy nebraska coming off of a big win yeah you know what we don't complain about here avery w's any w's yep. we have not earned the right to complain about w's yet i don't care how they look Iowa doesn't complain about their W's and they're uglier than anything. <laughs> I am not complaining, especially road W's in conference. I agree. Okay. Those are not easy to come by. Yep. So we are positive here on the show this morning about Nebraska's W's. We'll talk with Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald at 8 a.m. 9 o'clock. We'll talk to Adam McClintock, the college football professor. He goes into, man, I love talking to Adam because he college has. football professor. What a sick title. It, no, it's in, and he goes deep into the analytics and okay. stuff. It's awesome. And he has these coaching analytics mm. where he basically, you're, you're big into baseball, right? Yeah. So you know how they have kind of like all the adjusted statistics in baseball with mm-hmm. the same metrics where it's like adjusted for ballpark and adjusted for error yeah. and all these different things. He has these coaching metrics for college football that adjust for like differences in recruiting, differences in location, like wow. all these sorts of things. Holy cow. And I love talking to him. His stuff is I was DMing with him a couple of weeks ago, like finding out about how he goes about his process without like, you know, giving away the uh-huh. the juice there. Yeah. Although let's be honest, he could tell me the exact formula and I could not replicate <laughs> it. I'd be like, 
Those are some fancy looking numbers you got there, bud. You keep doing that. <laughs> it's like you keep yeah. doing you. <laughs> um, but no, his stuff is incredible. And he breaks it down uh, in a way that even idiots like me can figure out, which I appreciate. <laughs> um, and then we'll talk to Eric Bailey of the Tulsa world. He covers Oklahoma, who had a huge win. Yeah. In the Red River rivalry. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. I sent you a good tweet this week about that. You did. Yeah. yeah. I, we're watching the game there. And and you send me this this tweet. And it's it's about how all of the announcers and broadcasters are really struggling with uh -huh. that. And it I felt so much better. Because yeah. I have to think very specifically about saying it I correctly. Know. Yeah. I saw it and it cracked me. She's like, the best thing about watching this game is all the announcers trying to say Red River rivalry. And I was like. Bang, spot on. Yeah, I it made me feel much better. I was like, hey, I really am a professional broadcaster. I'm in good company. There. Seriously, so true. Yeah, it's, you had Kirk Herbstreet in I your know. company. Like, I was like, we're we're, we're, we're living good here. Yeah. We appreciate it. You're just one of them. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe someday. Uh, you can give us a call at 888-638-4876 if you want to be a part of the show. We got plenty of time for you here today. Or you can hop in the YouTube comments. We've already got Thomas and Dion giving us some feedback there. And you can hit us up on Twitter. I'm at R.A. Lula. That is at Avery Howard 31. Avery is spelled R-I-E at the end. I like to get make sure people know there. A-V-A. A-V-A-R-I-E Howard 31, uh, which. I'll make you search for it. It's true. Um, I'm going to bring this up. This is going to be awkward. Are you it's ready? Okay. That's okay. Are you ready? Go for it. You don't follow me on Twitter. I don't? No. So you know what's interesting? <laughs> you know what's interesting about this topic of conversation is that because of how many accounts I run at work, yeah. there's been times you where like I like have my of... I have my tweet thing open yeah. on the side. It's like recommended whatever. And the other day, like heard out sports, it was like, or maybe it was Hale Varsity. I don't know which one. It was like, follow um uh Ravi. And then the other one was like, follow someone else. And I was like, how are we not <laughs> following them? So I that's probably my bad because I don't even realize right. which accounts fall. And then when it pops up, I'm like, well, that's awesome. Sorry. And then it's like, it's like, do I follow now? And then do I need to bring it up in discussion? Right? Or do I just like wait until follow me? Like, hey, I'm, so <laughs> I'm really bad at that too. Yeah, no, I'm not good okay. at that. You know what? We're going to do it right now that we've had this discussion. That's good. You know, that's, this is yep. good. This is a growing moment on the show here. Work. Uh, you know, I was trying to debate. I was like, you know, I don't, I don't want to like shame anybody, but I was like, it is kind of awkward right. to be doing shows together so and, true. and not even Which follow is each funny other though, on Twitter. Because I see all of your stuff because we were talking about the for you page thing. Yeah. I see everything you post. And then on her dot sports, I see everything that pops up because I have notifications for all of our whatever like people. Our, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, I see all of your stuff. <laughs> yep. There you go. So all it, right, you got to follow notification. I, I did. Okay. Uh, there we go. We're all, we're all good. Okay, now. good. Uh, no, I actually, I did the exact same thing with Brian Christopherson. <laughs> yeah. I just started following him recently mm -hmm. because his stuff would show up on my timeline. Yeah. I was like, Oh, I obviously follow him because yeah. people retweet it or yeah. I follow all the other accounts or whatever. And then it just, I realized one day when we were doing the show and I went to his page, I was like, oh, I don't follow this guy. Uh -huh. And then there is that awkward moment of like, like oh, he's going to get the notification I know, now. I know. And he's going to know that I didn't follow him for yeah. all of this time. I know. But it's okay. We're, we're good now. We've got the, we've okay, got the Twitter fiasco handled. Uh, you can also watch the show on Twitter as well at Hurt at Sports. Um, and we <laughs> will we'll get everything squared away for you there. No more drama on the show where no. we've, got, we've got it all yeah, squared away. You, you in a good mood or what? Yeah. I, you know, I'm, you're, in a, I'm in a great mood, Shane. Um, we right. are, what do you guys got? <laughs> we've got <laughs> a lot. Next. Appreciate you. Shane just keeping us on track over here. I appreciate that. Uh, no, we've got a lot. Obviously let's start with Nebraska. Um, they've got they're three and three. Yeah. I feel okay about that. Yeah. You know, very easily could be four and two, but we're not looking back. We're looking, no. we're looking forward no. here. You know, can't change the past. And uh, you know, you look at the schedule, and we talked about this last week. Winning that Illinois game sets things up in a very manageable fashion. Yeah. For the rest of the season, right? The difference between three and three and two and four at this point, yeah, is enormous. Yeah. We would be having a very different conversation today mm -hmm. if they're two and four heading into a bye week, and we're like, okay, is mm -hmm. is there a winnable game left on the schedule yeah. anymore? Right. Yeah. Um, so as you're kind of, you're in Champaign this weekend, yeah. uh, briefly, and yeah, <laughs> so as you're kind of watching this game unfold, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week, how sometimes when you're covering a game, it comes at mm. you a lot faster as you're watching this game unfold. I, I'm kind of sitting there. I go, Hey, first half it's 17 0 for a long time. Okay. They get the, the seven before 
halftime at 17 7. Feel pretty good about how Nebraska's playing. Second half, which is kind of a flipped script from what we've been seeing, where Nebraska's been playing better in the second half yeah. than the first half. And you see just a ton of mistakes, mm -hmm. a ton of missed opportunities. I guess, how are you processing that in real time as you're also kind of saying, like, okay, if Nebraska loses this, mm -hmm. we're in a real tough spot moving forward? Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I did feel that way. I was going into halftime. I was like, wow, you know, zero points on the board for Illinois. So far, mm -hmm. seeing much more improved defense again. I also look at the stats and see that Heinrich has more passing yards and rushing yards. And so I was like, there's an attempt and an effort there. And it, on, I mean, it, to extend on that, like, there were some explosive plays. And I think that's been something discussed a lot. Like, can Nebraska get the ball down the field and have receptions? And when I say mm -hmm. explosive plays, I'm saying 38-yard receptions. But yeah. those weren't necessarily happening in the past few weeks. And there was more than one. Mm -hmm. So I think looking at some things, I was like, hey, there's been some improvements here. There's been some areas that people have been asking some questions. And it feels like there's been an area of emphasis there. I felt pretty good at halftime for obvious reasons. Yeah. And at the end of the game, obviously, you have the fourth quarter that you have. Like, when you look at the game timeline from both teams, it was like fumble, 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 interception, interception, punt, fumble, whatever it was, right? And so you're kind of like, whoa. But there was never a time when Illinois turned the ball over that I was like, um, okay, I'm a little bit nervous. Sure. Like, I because had of how the, the defense. defense was playing. I was like, I have a feeling of security with the defense right now. Yeah. And Maybe that's just because Illinois' offense isn't as threatening as others. It's a little inept. Yeah, yeah. but, I mean, they, you know, Altmaier still had a pretty good stat line in terms of passing yards. I mean, not necessarily completions and ratings and all that stuff, but sure. he still threw the ball around here and there. Um, so at the end of the game, I was like, you know what? I think my biggest thing that I was looking for was how can Nebraska respond? Like, mm -hmm. in the past years, how have we seen Nebraska respond after a tough loss? Mm -hmm. And then how we discussed last week, when you see it on paper – should they be winning this game? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But do they? No. So the fact that I, in my mind, I was watching the way that they carry their body language. I was watching the mentality. I was watching just kind of like the focus and warm ups, uh, the interaction with the head coaches. Like there was a fire that we hadn't heard yet in last week's press conferences. And so this was the first time we were going to see it on the field on display. Mm -hmm. And there was a definite difference. Like I just felt a complete, oh, so feel like you saw a complete it? energy yeah. shift because I was on Illinois' side for a little bit watching their warmups, and it was fine. It was just casual, just nothing. And no, I don't cover that team, so maybe I'm not just you know hyper focused on locked whatever. In, yeah. But on Nebraska's side, it just was like everyone was dancing and they were singing and they were like having a good time with each other. And I maybe I haven't seen this, but Rule was like in guys' faces. He was walking mm -hmm. up like they were on their warmup lines and. He kept, I, I, I wish I knew exactly what he was saying, but he kept throwing the word Sunday out there. And mm -hmm. that they kept referring to the Sunday practice, he said in the press conference. So I wish he, I knew what he was saying to them before. But then all the position coaches were kind of in their guy's ear. Like they were in a zone, like locked in. And the third and one stop, the fourth and one stop, huge. Goal just line to start yep. the game. Yeah. I mean, that was a seven minute drive that Illinois put together in the first, yeah. right? And the bench was going crazy, like to the point where I was like, they're all on the field. Like they're going to get off the field. But I just, I, and I know those are two huge stops. And at any other time you would hope a team's that excited, but I just don't feel like I've seen a team that fired up to start the game, whether it be coaches and players entirety. So there, that was what I was really looking at. So I think at the end of the game, I was like, please like, okay, that's a road win. Yeah. Sometimes road wins are hard and ugly. Yeah. And you're going into Especially a bye in week. Yeah. You're yeah. going to a bye week with a W for the first time in 2016. Like I think they would take that. And I think I was a little bit, surprised by how much of the response I was seeing on Twitter, people being like, well, that was like the worst thing I've ever seen. And, well, and listen, it was ugly. It was not pretty. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it was like, it was still a win. Yeah. And they got the job done. And after the week they had last week, yeah, it could have been completely and entirely different. And Illinois had won three games in a row in this series. Yes. Like this is not a team that you, that I mean, there's, there are no teams Nebraska has regularly no. beat, right? But Illinois even in particular has had their number. Um, maybe not to the degree of a Wisconsin or an Iowa yeah. until last year, but I mean, Nebraska's had a hard time of things against Illinois. Yeah, this is so. You know, I I agree with you there. I I had a hard time with some people the way they were talking about kind of I, I guess being disappointed in the yeah. performance. Listen, I've said this a million times, and I'll keep saying it. Nebraska hasn't earned the right to win pretty yet. And I think Coach Rule has said that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Like. like 
this summer is like we have we are still a four and eight team. Yeah. Like we have to there's gonna be a lot of ugly yeah. wins before you get to the pretty ones, and that's okay. Because mm-hmm. especially for where this program's coming from, mm-hmm. you have to get through the ugly ones, otherwise, there's not gonna be any pretty mm-hmm. ones, right? Like that's just how it is for this team. And I actually like as I was thinking about this game and kind of re-watching it yesterday, I I actually think games like this are really good for Nebraska. Yeah. Because there's still a bunch of guys on this team that know nothing except for losing these types of games. Yep. There are so many guys on this team that have lost almost this exact game before. Mm -hmm. Hey, they've got a double digit lead. They're going into the fourth quarter. Oh no, they start turning it over. Oh no, there's a bunch of procedural penalties and all of a sudden, Boom, Illinois wins 21-20. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what just happened? Yeah, when did that happen? You're yeah. like, you you wake up, you think you're in control the yeah. whole time, and you feel like you wake up from a fever dream, and all of a sudden Nebraska got another L hung on them. Mm-hmm. These wins are important for Nebraska to be able to – like, it's – this is a dramatic way of putting it, but guys have to learn that when things start to go bad, that is not the end of them. Yes, and that's one of the things that they'll carry on throughout the rest of their lives, hopefully. Yeah. Right? Because bad things are going to happen. Yep. Bad things yep. are going to happen to everybody, no yep. matter how great of a life you have, right? Bad things are going to happen no matter how good of a football team you have. Yeah. You're going to have adversity. Somebody's going, there's going to be a tip, tipped ball interception that just this random thing. You're going to mm-hmm. have weird weather days. You're going to have bad days as a football team, no matter how good you are, right? We saw Georgia have a couple bad days a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And they're back to back defending national champions. You know, we saw we saw Michigan have a part of a bad day against Rutgers not that long mm-hmm. ago. You know, this is I mean, JJ McCarthy threw three interceptions against bowling green. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And being able to process that and go, hey, yes, that's not great, yeah. but that's not the end of us. Mm-hmm. That is not the end of our story. We can keep going. Yeah. Those are lessons that Nebraska had not learned and had not been a part of Nebraska football for several years. Yeah. And being able to do that on the road against a conference opponent, I'm almost glad that they didn't pull away and blow them out. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they had to live with the tension Mm -hmm. of this game is still in the balance because of our mistakes for like a quarter and a half, really. Yeah. This game could have gotten put a could have Nebraska could have put this game away mm-hmm. a bunch of different times. I think they had what three red zone trips in the second yeah. half. Without yeah, there points. was there was definitely multiple times where it was like, okay, it had been it had been really great to convert there. Yeah, it'd been like okay, got Just down the give field me a and then three, you couldn't. Yes, you know that way. Yeah. Hey, you, it takes two touchdowns and two point conversions yep. mm-hmm. to beat them, and that that never that never happened. You never got that extra three points. You never got that extra touchdown, mm-hmm. and. There's a part of me that's really grateful for that. Now, would I have been thrilled if they blew him out? Absolutely. Yeah. Like when it's 17-0 in the first half and they get the, you know, they get that weird short kickoff mm-hmm. that Illinois fumbles and yeah. Harburg scores on the yeah. next play. Yeah. I was like, oh, we are beaten down tonight. <laughs> Let's go. And it just Nebraska's not that team right mm-hmm. now. You know, would it have been super fun? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Heard at sports bar was packed. It's a Friday night. Yep. Like I think it's the busiest I've been here for a game day. It was awesome. awesome. And everybody was hyped. And then it's it just doesn't happen, yeah. right? They only score three points the rest of the game. Yeah, that's true. And it's frustrating in the moment, right? Because you're like, just finish them. Just put it away. Because the fans have seen it too. The fans have been have experienced mm-hmm. the bumps in the road as well. Yeah. And it is super frustrating, and you just want to put them away because you're like, God, I don't know if I can take another one. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I don't this know. This isn't if... good for the heart rate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like we, you know, we eat too much ranch here in Nebraska yeah. to keep having these. <laughs> yeah, keep me down this somewhere, you guys. <laughs> yeah, like I cannot continue to do this, right? Yeah. But long term, I genuinely do think this is good for the football team. I do too, and I think, like I said, the biggest thing, even when I gave my recap, like I didn't really even get many numbers because. Yeah. At the end of the game, it was just like, yeah, like we all watched the same game. Mm-hmm. Like, like we all know what was good and we all saw what was bad. But like yeah. these are two programs that were coming out of incredibly hard weeks. Like which ones were going to be more motivated? And even though they both maybe were really motivated, mm-hmm. who could execute using all of that? And I think the biggest thing was what was the biggest message that we heard from Coach Rule last week? 
compete was mm-hmm. not at a high level enough last week. Like mm-hmm. who can come out and show me that they can compete, but also was like, who on this team is going to step up? How many more players do we see show back up this weekend? Mm-hmm. Like a m- great number of a them. Bunch. I thought, yeah, like Isaac Gifford was incredible all over the place. Like I thought John Bullock was great. Mm-hmm. Like Malcolm Hartzog was back. Like mm-hmm. there was just multiple names that we heard at the beginning of the season that have been there. I mean, Newsom had his first Quentin career Newsom, interception. Agree with you. Yeah. And it was like he's done a lot of small things right, but he just hadn't had kind of the home run yet. Yeah, and that big play. Yeah. And then you have um Phelan Sanford, who'd been talked about last week, yep. has the hit to, you know, cause the turnover. So players that had their name kind of thrown out there here and there all of a sudden were the headliner of the game. And yes, that was defense more or less. But even just some of the players that we thought needed to get more involved on offense, I think got some more touches, just little things like that. Mm-hmm that I would like to, I want to go back and watch the game as well and just look for the more of the small little detail stuff. Cause yeah. I'm sure those are in there. Um, but I think that was the thing that impressed me. It was like when there is a respect mutually for coaching staff and their team, mm-hmm. they were going to step up to the challenge because they could have heard that and been like, okay. Yeah. Just checked out. Got and it. I think we've cool. seen Nebraska teams do that recently. Yeah. Yeah. La- last week it could have been like, Hey, got it coach. Like, all right, we'll see what happens next week. Yeah. And then when the, t- when the game starts to slide the other direction, it could have been, here we oh. go again. Yep. Oh, Same thing we gonna, all say, right? What a coach will say that our defense wanted to play again. They wanted to go out on the field again where I would be like, Hey defense, love ya. Can you stay <laughs> over there? A little help and let the other one here? do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. But we will continue to recap Nebraska all of the college football weekend. And you know I'm going to talk about my 49ers and what they did last night. All that and more coming up on Herd at Sports Radio. We will- Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio. I'm Ravi Lula, Avery Howard with me this morning. You can hear us on AM 590 ESPN Omaha or ESPN Tri-Cities. Of course, you can follow us on YouTube and Twitter as well if you want to stream the show. and. See our lovely faces talking to you on a Monday morning. Get your week started off right. Um, there's a lot of interesting comments from Coach Rule this week. Mm-hmm. Um, from before the game, after the game. You know, you were kind of talking about how he was going up to guys, talking yeah. about Sundays before yeah. the game. And then you hear after the game, hey, was Sunday worth it? You know, and he goes, not to tell you I told you so, but kind of to, kind of to tell yeah. you I told you yeah. so, right? Yeah. It's okay sometimes to tell you, like, hey, I told you so. I told you it'd be worth it, right? Mm-hmm. Um and it, it would appear that, you know, I asked this last week, you know, that the that there was this chance that if things go well, if this team responds the way Coach Rule was hoping they would, and I think that we all were hoping they would, that this team, that we could look at that Sunday practice as kind of a turning mm-hmm. point. And I, I kind of worried, like, okay, maybe I'm making too much of this, but then I hear Coach Rule talk, and I'm like, oh, no, he made probably a bigger deal about it than I did. Yeah. Well, it was spoken about so many times, yeah. like, from every single coach, from every single player, like, last week. And I think sometimes, like, you, as a player, like, you dread the practice after a tough game like yeah. that. Like, you can, you're dreading it. Like, it, it's causing some anxiety. Mm-hmm. And then once it's over and it becomes this, like, fantastic practice and it's a whole lot of hard work and you really can see what a team is made of and you, like, it's this reminder. Like, that did not define us. Like, unfortunately, yeah. that's what happened to us and it wasn't our best. But, like, it's it's not our identity. And so I think those practices sometimes are, like, just it, – it's you walk away with a much better feeling. All the, it also clears the head. It's like a it, little cathartic, right? It does. It clears yeah. the mind a little bit. You can walk away and be like, hey, you know what? It's out of our system. Mm-hmm. We've proved it to ourselves as a team. We've, we've, we've had our, we've had our grounding moment. We've all come together. Like we know we cannot move forward without coming together. It's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so those practices sometimes after a tough game like that, sometimes be the, are the best. Like, you know, they're going to be hard. The coaches aren't going to be easy, but at the same time, like usually you walk away and the breakdown after practice is usually a much happier mood. Mm-hmm. And so I think sometimes on top of that, like you have that, whether it was a tough game or not, or it was a Michigan game or not, I think walking away from that, it was a reminder for them immediately after that game that, okay, that sucked. Like we still have the taste in our mouth, but like we know that, it can be better. We than know that. we have me because imagine if they went into the bye week after Michigan. Yeah, like that and you just have sucks to sit, to sit on, on for that long, for and then going to practice for two weeks thinking about Michigan. Like you might fix a lot, a hundred percent. Like that sucks. Like <laughs> yeah. you might have to sit on that like and get better, but to to not have an, a win under your belt or just have a competitive week of practice where you can work for mm-hmm. something four days later versus two weeks later, and you just have this mindset of like. We've had a lot of great practices, but what the heck does it mean right now? 
Yeah, I'm sure they've and, had a ton of great practices yeah. that didn't lead to wins. Right? right. And so for them to have, you know, a really hard practice immediately after. Yeah. And then let it pay off instead of being like, hey, we've had a really hard practice for two weeks because of that game. And we haven't really been able to do anything with it. Now it's just kind of like, this yeah. is tiring. Well, <laughs> this is it, exhausting. This is mentally straining to think about this. And it kind of leaves room for doubt to creep into your mind too, right? Yeah. When you've got two weeks of nothing but practice, let's say the bye week was after Michigan instead of Illinois, right? And you've got this horrible performance where, yes, you played a really good team, mm -hmm. also didn't play very well, mm -hmm. right? And you're sitting on that for two full weeks. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, that first week you might be like, yeah, okay, we're getting back at it. We're okay. And then you've got another full week without getting to a chance to prove yourself again. That's where you have to be really careful as coaches because it can allow the doubt to creep back yeah. in over those long breaks of, ah, oh, maybe we just aren't that good. Maybe we aren't able to compete at even a Big Ten West level. It's like, yeah, we knew we couldn't compete with Michigan, but I mean, well, I guess we lost to, we lost to Minnesota too. Maybe we're not even in that category. And maybe that's not the mindset of players, but if you look at the way th these things have gone in years past, I think you'd be hard to argue that there's not some of that in there, right? Yeah, yeah. And go instead, uh, you know, Co Coach Rule said something really interesting yesterday. He goes hard or not yesterday, whatever that he Friday found. night. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah there. It doesn't matter. These, yeah, I especially with the Friday night game, my days are all yeah. all discombobulated. Yeah. But yeah, this weekend was fake. Yeah, yeah, just it was it was a false weekend. Yeah. Um, but no, the he says working hard is never a punishment. Yep. Right. And that can feel like kind of a throwaway cliche line, whatever. But then you think about it in the context of what you just talked about. Mm -hmm. OK, they have a really hard game against Michigan where they don't play well. And then they come back immediately on Sunday with a really tough practice where they go full pads, which is super unusual. Mm -hmm. We talked to Michael Rose Ivy about it on Friday. And he's like, yeah, I went under Bo and he was a pretty hard dude. And we never went on Sunday like that. Um, that's like an unusual thing. And it wasn't, but it wasn't a punishment, right? No. I think you can look at, hey, we're going hard on Sunday because you weren't good enough on Saturday, mm -hmm. and this is your punishment. It was like, no, I know we, and he said this, he verbalized this during the week. He goes, hey, I know we can play better than we did on Saturday, so we're going to go play better than yeah. we did on Saturday. Yeah, so we are going to. Immediately, mm -hmm. right? We're going to show ourselves that we're better than what we showed on Saturday. And then when you when you reframe that, it's like, oh, that's not a punishment. That's an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? That's an mm -hmm. opportunity to remind yourself, hey, we're better than we showed. Mm -hmm. And man, like the way that resonates. And listen, if they don't win against Illinois, like maybe it all feels a little different, right? Totally different entirely. But it worked. It did work. That's the point mm -hmm. is like Coach Rule said, hey, not to tell you I told you so, but I told you so. Yeah, right? it's like we're in the middle of the season, and I know this is maybe the mindset we were in coming to fall camp. Like mm -hmm. you're fired up, ready to prove some things, and now you've been knocked down a little bit, but like that doesn't go away. Like yeah. this was maybe a resurgence of energy, resurgence of belief yeah. again that like we have the same mentality throughout. Like even though you get knocked, like we're at the compete level has to stay. You know, I also thought about something over the weekend, just seeing so much of the feedback about this game. And Yes, Nebraska's three and three mm -hmm. had some losses that people think could have been wins, like at least one. At I least mean, maybe, the, like the, maybe the Minnesota you, one you split Minnesota sure. Colorado. I think maybe like when you, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, yeah. But do you think, as a fan base or even just those covering, there have been so many incremental improvements on this team mm -hmm. that? we as viewers have not realized have been so dramatically different than some of the years past that now our expectation level has gotten higher than we expected it to be. Yeah. We've already reset our expectations because it feels like the response that I saw this past weekend, I was like, it feels like a year ago, people were like, Hey, sweet. Get that dub. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. it feels like this, this year already, just because of the mindset that we've mm -hmm. heard and just the teachings that we've heard and just like the philosophy that it's like, that was good. But I do, I do think that like Nebraska has like a different level or I think where I just feel like the ceiling has been lifted a little bit because of the staff and like the messaging that we've heard so much mm -hmm. where last year it would have been like, Hey, you know what? We'll chalk it up for a W and we'll see what happens next yeah. week where now it's kind of like, mm, it was okay. Which I think the the healthy place is a balance in between those things, right? Like, yeah. be happy with the win. Yeah. Be happy with a road conference win because those are always hard, mm -hmm. right? But also understand, hey, there's there's higher expectations and higher levels that this team can get to because 
I mean, even if you look at it, all right, still missing Luke Reimer, maybe their their best defensive player. Deshaun Singleton, who had maybe been up to this point their best defensive back through the season. He is doing some good things, Bo. Um, Marcus Washington goes out on the first drive of the game, yeah, I believe, yeah. after that big catch. Um, so you've got a true freshman, Malachi Coleman, getting a bunch of those snaps yeah. in. Uh, you've got your two starting running backs hurt. Mm-hmm. You have the guy that was your starting quarterback to start the season hurt. Yeah. Which we kind of just forgot about. Yeah. Like, Heiner Carberg wasn't supposed to be the starter. No. <laughs> you nope. know? And and that's something I do want to talk about later. But, you know, there's all of these things that have happened. Like, yeah. if Nebraska last year, I mean, we saw this. Anytime Nebraska was playing without a starting quarterback over the last four, eight, 12 Take years, habit. it's like, Take uh, that game. We're done here. Like, this isn't going to work out. You throw this guy in there that thought he was going to be a tight end in the spring, and he's like, hey, we're good to go. He's 3-1 and one as the starter. Heiner Carberg is 3-1 and one as a starter. His one loss is to the no, number. Like, no, like, say it again. No, he's 3-1 <laughs> and one as a starter. His only loss is to yeah. Michigan. Yeah, I know. Listen, I get he hasn't played world beaters, <laughs> mm-hmm. okay? But the first thing was like, oh, he only played a group of five teams at home, That uh, whatever. Well, guess what? He's got a road conference win now. Yeah. All right? Like, Against a team that was eight and five last year. I get that they've regressed this year mm-hmm. in Illinois, but that's a road conference win. Mm-hmm. As a backup quarterback who's now three and one as a starter, mm-hmm. like that I don't know that we appreciate how un how unrealistic that's been in Nebraska's very recent history. Yeah, like Heinrich's gotten love, but like have we yeah, in terms of historical looking at it, like especially recent history. Yeah. Right. This is not something Nebraska has historically done well. Yeah. We've been lamenting the lack of depth of the quarterback position for years Mm -hmm. and rightfully so. Yeah. And then when it happens, we're just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. We don't even acknowledge it. Yeah. He's, yeah. Cool. (laughs) Yeah. Of course he was going to do that. He's a Nebraska kid. Yeah. Nebraska kid. I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We will wrap up our hour number one here on Hurtout Sports Radio coming up next. Wrapping up our number one here on a Monday on Hurt At Sports Radio. I'm Ravi Lula, Avery Howard here with me to get your week started off right. We're going to talk to our friend Sam McEwen here in just a few minutes from the Omaha World Herald, get his thoughts on the Nebraska win against Illinois. Um, there were a couple of things that he that Coach Rule said in the press conference that I, I kind of wanted to get to um, before we get too deep into things here. And one of them was the the thing with the procedural penalties that he was talking about. Because I know that was a, a point of frustration, not just for myself, but kind of on just scrolling through Twitter. Yeah. A pretty big issue because that's something that Nebraska has had issues with a lot over multiple coaching staffs. And it, it's a really frustrating deal, right? And so Coach Rule kind of addressed that uh, at the press conference and like, hey, we're not an undisciplined group. Like they're doing things that you're not supposed to be able to do that. I was told you can't do in terms of mimicking the snap count and things like that. And so I'm sitting there. I was like, okay, that makes sense. I appreciate him sticking up for his guys. But then I also kind of start thinking in the back of my head, right? So I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was a a game Nebraska was playing against Iowa when Scott Frost was the head coach. And Iowa was doing this thing where they were clapping Mm. to kind of simulate the snap count. Mm. And, it was a thing that caused Nebraska some issues, some procedural issues. And then Co- uh, Coach Frost brought it up after the game, and it was kind of met with a little bit of derision and um, kind of mocking him almost a little bit. Be like, oh, you can't even figure it out. Like, oh, the other team's clapping. It's like, yeah, the whole stadium's clapping, bud. Like, you can't figure it out. Um, and that's really not the way it was met when Coach Rule brought up the issue. And so this is kind of a self-check as much as anything. Yeah. And I think I know the answer, but I'm curious to, to see what your thoughts are. Why do we view those two things so differently? Because they essentially were talking about the same thing. Because you're not, I mean, we saw, uh, I, I believe Gifford, yeah, or it was either Gifford or Reimer, get a penalty for it earlier this well, year for clapping. Yeah. Because he was trying to get his guys yeah. to do something They're like, hey, he was mimicking the snap. That's a penalty. Yeah. So I guess why, in your mind, why do we process those two situations so differently? Because it's essentially the same thing. Um, I just think uh, the way that coach rules handled the media handled the way he interacts with them. Yep. Uh, yeah. post game interactions. I think the way that he's handled t- uh, difficult subjects has gained respect from a lot of people. And I think it just feels like even when things go wrong, 
he has an answer that feels authentic, Mm -hmm. but also admitting that I haven't looked at it yet. I don't know yet. I'm going to be completely transparent with you yet. I have to go look. That's something that so, but at the same time has it in a way that doesn't feel like it didn't cross his mind. Like, Oh, I didn't see that. I don't know. I don't know. He's not being dismissive. Right. Um, or I, I didn't catch that. Whereas like, well, everyone caught that. Like how, you Mm -hmm. know, as the head coach where he's being like, I recognize it. I need to go look at it. And you know, it's like a 24 hour rule kind of thing. Um, so I just think the way he's interacted or he's just, um, created some of those relationships I think has made it harder for media and Twitter I guess you could say to respond the way that they do yeah. because I think there's a little bit more of a respect value there I think you're right the thing I kind of landed on was I feel like we believe he's telling us the truth more often than we did with Scott Frost and I think that's probably fair to say because when we hear words from rule we usually see an action that follows yes where I think before it was like, we see some words spoken, nothing really that we're not really getting much of a message. Yeah, anyway. Nothing changes it's a little bit kind of ambiguous. And then there's not much to show for it. I think the other thing that for me with the, the difference between Frost and rule and, and listen, I think that was like year three or four with Scott Frost. Obviously we're very early in on the Matt rule tenure. So we have no idea how this is going to go. Totally. Right. Um, but for me, I think a lot of it was, I really struggled because I didn't feel like Scott Frost would take accountability Mm -hmm. for things that he had control over or that his team should have control over his other coaches should have control over. And it feels like coach rule takes responsibility for everything, whether he's got control of it or or not. Mm -hmm. He usually says, Hey, that's on me or that's on us as the coaches or whatever doesn't really pass the buck doesn't really i mean really doesn't throw his players under the bus pretty much ever um and so i think that's a big part of it for me is is if he's willing to take responsibility for pretty much everything we hear him talk about and then when he brings up an issue it's like oh this must be a real issue Mm -hmm. whereas with coach frost it felt like oh everything is he's just kind of making excuses for everything mm-hmm. that's how it felt right now yeah. maybe that's not even fair that's kind of why i wanted to talk about it yeah. because <laughs> uh, as i'm processing this in real time i was like hey that is messed up like, mm-hmm. you can't do that yeah and then i i thought back to this iowa clapping thing and i was like am i being a hypocrite here mm-hmm. like I, i'm just you know trying to you know because i'll you know it's i'm pretty out there i wasn't a huge scott frost fan especially the last few years of his tenure there yep. And I've been very publicly supportive of rule as mm-hmm. well. So I, I'm, I just want to, I'm trying to make sure I'm not just defending the guy that I liked versus yeah. throwing the guy I didn't like under right. the bus. I also think this is like just natural and human nature, but when you know more about a human and there's more of a human connection or there's more of a respect level, mm-hmm. it's much harder to be as critical or, yeah. and you give I them hate, the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, Hate's not the right word, but you know, be quick to like have some hate. hate yeah. You know? So, you know, when you humanize something, yeah. it feels very different. I feel like we've had more of an access to Coach Rule and just more insight on his philosophy. And I think he's also willing to share it with most of us because he knows what it's been like being a fan mm-hmm. of this team and having like a lack of transparency or and not that it's quite frankly, none of it's really our business. No. At the end of the day, it really isn't like, yes, we're a fan of the team and yes, we work in it. But and I guess I'm referring more to the fan aspect. Like mm-hmm. we we don't really have to know really what goes on behind closed doors. Like no. their practices are their practices and their team meetings are their team meetings. And like what he says to his players belongs, you know, sometimes between a player and a coach. But I think just because the way that he's created those relationships, like I said, and I think people have gotten to know him and understand like what the mission, what the goal is. I think that was a little bit blurry in the last right. staff that it was like, well, what are we working towards? Like, what is the goal right now? And mm-hmm. when I think there's a lack of accessibility and also you just don't really know someone yeah it's much easier to be like well i don't like you yeah i don't like what you have to say about it's that. it's the unknown right the yeah. unfamiliar that we kind of yeah. bristle up against yeah. right and it feels like we have a better relationship for lack mm-hmm. of a better word with matt rule after less than a year i mean we're what he's 10 months into the job right mm-hmm. now uh, i guess he's almost a full year into the job right now at this yeah. point Get, got hired late November. Yeah, woo, that's crazy. Right? Yeah. Like, that's hard to think about. It's like, hey, he's been on the job like six months. Nope, no, almost no, been a full no, year no. now. Yeah. Um, But it, it feels like we have a better relationship with Coach Rule after just about a year 
than we ever did with Scott Frost. We just never got a lot from him on a like human level, like you were talking about. I also think um, we've 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 discussed it a, a lot about just how much Coach Rule has experience in these mm -hmm. kind of programs. I mean, we talked about it more. It feels like obviously back in November, December, yeah, on the and front end, the beginning yeah. of the season, a little bit with some losses, but. How much do you think that also subconsciously plays into it? Like, yes, Scott Frost did help a UCF team. Mm -hmm. and he had helped an Oregon team. Never really, I mean, at UCF, yes, but he wasn't the head of the ship in some of those other programs he started at where, like, we know in the back of our head that Coach Rule has come in and done these things yeah. in multiple programs as the leader. Mm -hmm. And, like, has, I would say there's a respect from him. I mean, we've talked to someone last week and he was like, you guys are in great hands. Like, yeah, there's been a lot of people that have said that, like you, you're, you're, you know, it's good. You're was, good. I think Barry Tremel last week so. with yep. Oklahoma when, when they were looking for a head coach, yeah. he said, Hey, Brent Menables was my number two. Matt rule was, was my, my number, number one. one. Yeah. And so right. to hear that from other people and for too, Oklahoma, like, like Oklahoma, like they've been in college football playoffs yeah. very recently. So I think subconsciously, whether we realize we're, we have that, in the, like that bias in the back of our head or not, we've also heard other people. Mm -hmm. have high regard for him but also we have proof to know that he has some process that he stands by yeah that when we hear it it's like okay we're gonna trust it we're gonna trust it where i think with scott frost it was like what grounds do we have to trust at the moment right after the initial after they start to struggle with frost right yeah you look back and you're like oh that resume is maybe a little lighter than i realized yeah. you know like oh he's only been a head coach for two years yeah, the at a quick group turnaround of, at ucf was only so exciting for so long yeah it's right? like two yeah. years at a group of five schools a head coach is all of his head coaching experience right mm -hmm. and uh, i i guess i didn't realize he didn't call plays the whole time at oregon as the offensive coordinator he was yeah. kind of co and mark helfrich was calling plays and you, you start to look at it really fast and, and i think that kind of speaks to i don't know if it was everybody or just me or just kind of the people that i talked to there was always like a little bit of anxiety with Scott Frost because you're like, I think he can do it. Mm -hmm. I think he's the right guy to yeah. do it. But there was always a little bit of like, he hasn't actually done it. Yeah. Right. Especially not at this level. And with, with Coach Rule, there's no question about that. Right. He did a group of five, he did a power five, and now he's here. Like there is a track record of, yes, this guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I was just curious because I, yeah. I really, you know, I, I found myself, Kind of, kind of a little bit grossed out by myself, almost like, a little oh, bit. No. You're like, oh, am I doing that thing? Shoot, that I... was I the Twitter troll? Was it's like, I, am I, was I the problem? Am I? Is it me? Is it me? Am I the drama? Am I the drama? Oh no! <laughs> um, wrapping up hour number. It's okay, you know what? The first step they say is being is, aware. Right? Yeah, so it's admitting that yeah. you've got a problem, yeah. right? So I'm glad we could have one this step forward. Little therapy session here yeah. to wrap up hour number one. Coming up next, we'll have Sam McEwen of the Omaha World Herald on her at Sports Radio. Kicking off hour number two here on a Monday morning on Herd at Sports Radio. I'm Ravi Lula. Avery Howard here with me. And joining us on the War Horse Sportsbook hotline is our friend Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. Sam, how are you this morning? Good. How are you guys? We are doing well. So, you know, it's a little bit, you've had a little bit longer weekend since the Nebraska game with that Friday kick. Um, I guess just two days out, how have you processed that? win that was uh, certainly ugly at times, especially in the second half, but at the end of the day is a conference road win, which have been few and far between for Nebraska recently. Yeah, I thought Nebraska's defense did a really good job of containing Illinois' potential explosiveness. Obviously, Illinois hit a few. They hit a long pass. They hit a swing pass. But Williams on the first drive, but but they did a nice job. Nebraska's defense did a really good job of, of containing what Illinois could do. And I think there's a lot going on with Illinois right now in terms of their offense. Brett Bielema not on the same page with this offensive coordinator. Anybody uh, who probably, and not probably many people, did watch Brett Bielema's post-game press conference, but there, there's a lot of frustration there. They, I think there's just a lot of sense of the offense isn't really running the way that, that Bielema wants, and they're mm -hmm. going to have to think about what they're doing because uh, Nebraska was able to deter Illinois from running the ball very early in the game. And and that, I thought that was strange. Uh, and Illinois doesn't have enough enough of a passing game, good enough offensive line to just be able to sit back there 47 times. They threw it 47 times. They probably called 50 to 52 passing plays. That's a lot. And it, it didn't add up to much. And so I thought Nebraska's defense did a really good job of of containing Illinois, and then you got the special teams play. When you get plays like that, and I know it wasn't specifically a touchdown, but it led to a touchdown, mm -hmm. almost always 
you win the game. Yeah. Almost always. If you get a touchdown that's related to special teams, you usually don't lose. It, it, it's, it's one of those deals where it pisses off the other team so much. It's so demoralizing. And in a lot of cases, coaches will go back and go so stupid that it, that it creates just this sense of frustration. And I think that play kind of, kind of sealed the game. Now, you know, Illinois had plenty of chances in the second half and Nebraska should have won the game by 30. Didn't. But that play, you know, Grant Taggy hustle and all the rest, and that usually that sinks you. And and Nebraska was able to capitalize, and so I think that was kind of the game. They they got some things done in the special teams phase that helped, and uh, you know they, they were able to drive it home. wasn't a pretty game on offense, but didn't have. Last week we heard Coach Rule challenge his team a lot, and you know we heard in the Monday press conference following the Michigan game, like we have to have our guys show up. Me and Robbie were talking about this a little bit earlier. It felt like uh, some specific guys kind of rose to that challenge. Just names we heard earlier in the season be called a lot more on Friday. Who who impressed you on Friday, or who do you think kind of answered that call for Coach Rule? Oh, Bullock, yeah, Henrich. Isaac Gifford had yeah. maybe his best game, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Gifford had the play against Michigan. And I don't know. I mean, he, he's, he's probably not going to forget it because that's the kind of guy he is, but the middle of their defense, uh, um, Mocker played pretty well against Michigan, but, but he, you know, he had a good game. Uh, some of their, their edge rushers, I thought Prince Will had a good game. Jamari Butler had a good game. So most, most of the guys on the defense. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that Nebraska played that poorly on offense against Michigan. There's there's certainly things that you know hindsight being 2020 again, maybe you do a few a few things differently in that game. I thought they abandoned the run quickly, but but I thought Harvard played okay against Michigan, and I thought he played okay at times against Illinois. I, I think especially in the first half, he he did some good things. Second half, I think there was a little bit of unfocus there, mm-hmm. uh, whether it was play calling or it was you know some of his decision making, you know so the crispness of the execution. Uh, again, Nebraska has a tendency when they when they either get way behind <laughs> or they're or they feel like they've got a lead to start like okay, let's grind clock, let's 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 put this thing in our back pocket, let's save some of our cool stuff for another day. And Nebraska ran a lot of the same plays. I mean, they, now they might have run them out of different formations, but you know, they were running that cross that cross buck play pretty consistently there, and so. You know, you got to finish the game. I, I would have liked to have seen a couple throws to the end zone to finish it yeah. off and and get out of there. But um, I, yeah, I thought the defense responded really, really well, and and that's the kind of unit that's going to respond to a really physical practice. Yeah, my mm-hmm. sense of the offense is they didn't necessarily love that that practice <laughs> at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think they got a lot. I'm not sure they got a lot out of it. Yeah, but, but the defense did. And yeah, I think that's where they need to build their culture. Yeah, Sam. Uh- could I make the argument, you know, you mentioned it would have been nice if they had taken a couple shots at the end zone and, and kind of spread this thing out a little bit further. Can I make the argument to you that it was better for their long-term development to win one that stayed ugly? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, that that's, it might have been better for the defense, yeah, in the sense that, you know, the defense had to keep going out there and dealing with the adverse conditions of, watching the offense uh, make that mistake over and over for sure. Yeah. Um, and they're probably going to face that again. They obviously face that circumstance against Minnesota and mm-hmm. lost, and they face that circumstance against Illinois and won. So there's a good chance they're going to face that circumstance again, somewhere down the line, whether it's Purdue or it's uh, Iowa, Michigan state or Maryland. Somewhere in there, Nebraska is going to have a lead. They're going to have to close it out. I, I think you want your offense to to do a little bit more there. And and again, I mean, they're just a little bit limited in in the things that they can do. Uh, at the end of the day, the option has its limits. There's things that you can get done in the option game. I think we saw some of those things, but that's an offense that's really dependent on timing and consistency and doing it for years on end. And Nebraska just doesn't have that body of knowledge. So. That's a that's going to be a curveball or a, not a gimmick play, but you know, sort of the side dish. The main dish is that they got to try to run the ball with power, and, and they're still they're still in a journey there, and it's probably going to be a journey all season long. It felt like this game was a response game for both teams, just because of the losses both were coming off of. And when we talked to some writers from Illinois last week, you know, they were saying that 
they were having a lot of internal conversations, tough conversations at Illinois. So it was kind of a matter of which team was going to be able to respond the best this past weekend. Be- from your observation, did it feel like the entire game from the start? I, I mean, down on the field, it just felt like Nebraska had a different sense of urgency and fire compared to some past seasons after coming off a tough, tough loss. Like, did that feel like a new thing to see from the Nebraska team to be so ready to be fired up and kind of follow up with the action or the words we'd heard them speak last week, like being so angry? Yeah, I think that certainly there was a kind of, um, you, you can push that button once, the yeah. button they pushed on Sunday. Yeah. And the hope is that when you push it, there's a response and then you don't do it again, you know, and, and because you don't need to. Yeah. Uh, it either works or it doesn't. And, and it worked. And I think, I think the message was designed to be sent to the defense. And I think the message was received. And that, that group uh, has, I think is increasing in its pride. It's been a long time, Avery, since Nebraska has uh, really decided to lean on its defense really mm-hmm. since the both linear. They just haven't been that kind of program. Yeah. And so it's been a while since they've, they've really wanted to say the defense is what's going to win us this football game. And, and I think you can always appeal to the emotional pride of defenders. Offense is a little trickier. It, it, it's execution. It's, it's uh, play calling. It's you know the right the right moment at the right time. There's a there's a you know a thinking component to it that uh, any quarterback's got to grow into. You know you wouldn't expect Harvard to know all the things that he's right. done over the course of four hours. But on defense, you can you can get a lot done by playing really hard and running to the ball and hitting violently and i think nebraska so long as it retains that identity yeah and they're playing a bunch of guys which motivates people when mm-hmm. they get on this i mean Ryland van poppel plays four plays but but one of his four plays is one of the most important plays of the game mm-hmm. anytime you can play a bunch of guys and you can motivate them by this may be the play that determines this game the, the four plays that you're on the field i think you're you're starting from a good place now to go to the next level which anytime we do this, we look at what just happened, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen in three years, what's going to happen in five years. Mm-hmm. To get to the next level, especially with Oregon and Washington coming into coming yeah. into the league and USC and UCLA, you have to score points. Yeah. You have to mm-hmm. find a way because, you know, you put Nebraska's hard work and defense on a field against Oregon or USC, they're not going to hold that as a team to seven points. So you've got to find a way to put points on the board sooner or later, and Nebraska's got to continue to work on that. We're talking with Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. Uh, Sam, you mentioned a couple times sort of the limitations of the offense, which, you know, I I don't think any reasonable person could argue with you. But I'm curious what you kind of attribute that to, because there are a lot of sort of variables on the offensive side of the ball right now, whether it's, you know, top two running backs being out, two of the top three wide receivers being out. Uh, Obviously, the original starting quarterback is out. You know, there's been some guys being banged up on the, on the offensive line as well. I mean, how much of the limitations do you think are due to personnel issues from injury standpoint, from personnel issues from, hey, Nebraska maybe just has never had the guys this year that were going to be a, a real high-powered offense? And, and how much of it do you maybe think is either schematic or play calling? I think most of it's personnel-related. I think certainly Nebraska would, would be a better offense if, if Marcus Washington – Isaiah Garcia, Castaneda, Xavier Betts were all on the field. I think Nebraska would be a better team if it had three running backs instead of, you know, uh, or four instead of two. Uh, you know, Emmett Johnson appears, uh, appears to be the second guy. You know, Emmett had a couple of good runs. Mm-hmm. I, I, I know he fumbled the ball, but but I, I think he also had a couple of good runs. So, you know, I think, sure, the, if they had more personnel, it would be better. I think that the challenge with an offense like this is, Again, they want to run power, so they, they're often out there in twenty in twelve personnel or sometimes in twenty two or twenty one, but a lot of times the fullback functions as a you know, as a, as a tight end in the backfield, even if it's Bonner. Mm-hmm. I think it just takes time to learn how to run this offense. It's it, it, it's a it's a power based offense. You have to learn how to block. Your running backs have to learn the difference between what a zone running the zone and running a gap play. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pre snap shifts and you know trades and all these other things. It's an intricate kind of system. What you're trying to do when you're doing that is by the time you get set and it's time to run the football play, 
you kind of have a pretty good idea of where everybody's going. It looks real pretty when it works. You have an idea of where everybody's going, and the defense is trying to figure that out for a half second, and hope you hope that you hit something. Mm -hmm. And so that takes time. Um, you know, I would describe it as a big play offense, and and big play offenses usually have pretty good play design. Look at the 49ers last night, for example. Uh, look at the Dolphins, which run pretty much the same offense. They run it with some better players than the 49ers at receiver, but they run pretty much the same stuff. They're actually designed to hit big plays. Um, people might think it's a grinding out offense, but that's actually the, the no huddle up tempo thing where you're running the same zone play five times in a row. Mm -hmm. So I think they're trying to figure out how to run certain plays and get better at that stuff. Uh, the body of knowledge will build over time. We'll see where it ends up, you know, by the end of the season, by next year, so on and so forth. I think again, rule has a three to five, you know, he has a, he has a long view and a long vision window. And he knows that eventually you, and Marcus Satterfield knows eventually you've got to be able to throw the football. You, you, you do. Uh, now Michigan's able to do what it's able to do and good for Michigan. But when Michigan <laughs> goes to the playoff, or they play Ohio State, they have to find a way to throw the football. You can't, you can't go into those games and throw it 12 times and think you're going to win. So, you know, Michigan knows that, and Jim Harbaugh can throw the ball whenever he wants, and they can throw it for a lot of yards. They, they're, you know, they're really good at throwing the ball when they want. Nebraska's got to get there. They, they have to be able to throw it 25 to 30 times a game and feel comfortable completing 20 of those passes, uh, and that's going to take some time, and it's probably going to take better players, and it's going to take uh, Malachi Coleman and Jalen Lloyd learning how to play the position because they need to play more, especially if Marcus Washington's hurt. Yeah. Coming off a of bye week, you have an extra week of healing for Jeff Sims, sounds like. So Coach Rules told us how comfortable he would be playing a two quarterback system. Now that we were speaking on this earlier, Heinrich's three and one in that position, maybe that's an unjust, you know, comment just because of the situations Jeff Sims was in the first two weeks, but how do you feel like this offense finds a rhythm and then maybe inserts another quarterback into that and also trying to figure it out then as well? How does that change maybe the look of what this offense could be? Well, I'm not coach or player or former player or any of these things. What I'll say is that the concern that I had with Sims in the, in the, the seven quarters that he played was when he throws the ball, it's, it's, it's about three yards off the ground. Two yards. I mean, it, he just throws a flat ball. Yeah. And so, if 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 he can come back and there's a there's a layer, you know, he's able to layer a throw, or or he's able to get into a, a window and make make a throw, um, that would be great. I I just don't I don't know where he's at there. I think they could probably run pretty equally. Uh, Harburg may be faster at his top end speed, but I think Sims is probably very similar in his acceleration ability. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference between the two guys. I do think that that Harburg has shown a few things throwing the football that that uh, it's raw and there's there's a long ways to go, but there's things that you like. You know, there's there's definitely things that you he he hangs in the pocket a little bit, and I like that about him. And yeah, he's thrown a couple off his back foot, but but he's done a pretty good job of moving around the pocket. People forget that when he was in high school, he basically ran a shotgun passing off. <laughs> and he does know how to do that. There's, there's a body of knowledge there. There is too with Sims. So, you know, maybe he'll, maybe Sims will get back in the game and he'll look really, really good. And you'll have an interesting conversation uh, to, to think about. Uh, I think, you know, we'll, we're just going to have to see. Uh, certainly they thought Jeff Sims was by far and away their best choice. Uh, before the season and they they did that because you know obviously Casey Thompson left but sort of Logan Smothers and Smothers would be a great fit <laughs> for the option <laughs> that they're running now so yeah you know that's a good point. and so uh and he left and he's so, having a good season it seems like yeah, yeah 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 and they're running they're it's Rich Rod's offense mm -hmm. so, you know, he's, he's running it fine yep but you know I think I think the point being that you know, to get where they want to go, they, they've got to be able to throw the football. And, and I, you know, I'm not sure what, what exactly they saw on film with, with Sims before he got here, but, but Sims, he's throw balls more touch. There's just no other way to put that. He's thrown three interceptions in seven quarters where quite frankly, the ball just was, was thrown on such a line that a, uh, he didn't see the guy in front of him apparently, but B that you know, he just threw it right to him. 
and you've got to throw the ball with a little bit more touch. And, and Harbrook's generally done that, you know, and, and so I think he, I think that's the area where Sims has to continue to, to grow. I, I won't surprise me if Jeff Sims gets a drive or two against Northwestern. He might even get it in the first or second quarter, but I, I, I think Harburg may have earned the opportunity to be the starter at the same time. He's, he's played okay. He yeah. hasn't played poorly. So yeah. he hasn't been the problem. Uh, on offense, if they've had one, it hasn't been that. So I, I think he'll, I think he'll get another chance. Sam, just kind of talking about Harburg and his progression over his four games as a starter. Plus, you mentioned the quarter at the end of Colorado. There, have you seen a noticeable progression with him as a passer? Because from my vantage point, it does seem like he's getting more comfortable throwing the football. I'm curious what you've seen in terms of of his progression there. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's he's looked okay. At times, yeah, I thought he did a nice job on the, on the, you know, get out of get out of jail throw down there at the end zone to Washington. Threw it a little behind him, which isn't a bad thing. What you're trying to do there is get a completion, mm-hmm. and if you got to under throw it a little bit and throw it back shoulder, you do that. I thought that was a good throw. I thought the the first third down throw to to Fedoni, he was off his back foot a little bit, but he did a nice job there of being patient, and letting Fedoni shake that guy loose, and, which he did, and and, and making that throw. I thought he found a way on fourth down, uh, the sidewinder throw to Alex Bork. I think that's a heck of a play. Like you, on fourth down, you do whatever you got to do. Mm-hmm. You don't worry about how pretty it. <laughs> and he got it done, you know. And and that was a good throw. So there was some moments in there where you you like what you see. Again, I think that the physical components and tools are are generally there. If then it just becomes a question of. Can you tighten things up? Can you read defenses? Can you, you know, can you get some, some either Coleman and Lloyd to kind of you know, accelerate their growth process, or can you get some players who, uh, you know, uh, in the transfer portal for next year and all those things? Yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think he's played okay, and Nebraska's got one of the, you know, the least um, explosive, or not explosive, but. They're throwing for fewer yards than pretty much every team in the country. So we don't want to pretend that that they're that they're whatever. But uh, you know, if I look at where Ethan Kelly McManus was at the beginning of the season, and I look at where he was against Michigan, I think Harvard's you know caught up to him. Uh, mm-hmm. Kelly McManus throwing two pick sixes against Michigan. So you know, yeah. I mean, I think you go into the second half of the season, the defenses are going to watch, and they're going to be like, all right, here's how we're going to get this. Back. And and so Harburg's going to have to pay attention to that, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But I think he's doing okay, and and I think he'll continue to develop. Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald joins us every Monday. Sam, we appreciate your time. We'll talk to you next week. Take care, guys. Thank you. That's our friend Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. Um, some really interesting stuff there. There is a, a topic I want to get to that he touched on briefly, right, when we are talking about Jeff Sims and Heinrich Harburg. And it's a thing that I'm utterly fascinated by. And it's how you have these guys in your, whether it's your quarterback room or wherever, right? You have these guys on your team, in your room, and you you don't understand what you have, Mm -hmm. right? And I think there's some of that here with Harburg. Um, There's definitely like the, the Brock Purdy thing blows my mind, right? Not just because I'm a um, 49ers fan, but I, I think anybody who's you know likes the NFL and paying attention to the NFL dreams of that situation for their team, right? Where they yeah. they just they they draft a, a a nobody pick, right? Whether it's in the you know third round like the Seahawks got with Russell Wilson, whether it's in the sixth round like the Patriots got with Tom Brady. Not saying Brock Purdy's on those guys' level yet. I mean, he's probably better than Russell Wilson is right now. Um, or, you know, Mr. Irrelevant, the way Brock Purdy was, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of, and, and part of it's because I coached for a long time and I, I kind of sit here wondering to myself, like, did I have one of those guys on my team that I yeah. just didn't play? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about this though, is like, was Brock Purdy really that irrelevant though? Like he had a great career at Iowa State. He did. Like but he was totally forgotten about as an was, NFL prospect. A hundred percent. But like, when you look at what he did in at Iowa State and like, just the belief he brought, I feel to that mm-hmm. program. Like when you look at his long list of like awards and honors at Iowa State, like it just 
it just keeps going. It just keeps yeah. going. Like it just keeps going. And like almost 4,000 passing yards in a senior year, like had a pretty, I mean, he took, like, he took Iowa state to a fiesta bowl. I was, I was just going like, to say and, Iowa state. And by the way, like a fiesta bowl <laughs> offensive MP, MVP, like yeah. I understand like, you know, when it, you know, all those things don't translate, like you can have a great college quarterback and yeah. it just doesn't make sense. In the NFL. A lot of times, but I, I feel like to watch it pay off the way it has before, I feel like it was kind of like, okay, like, I'm happy that he's getting the opportunity because, like, we did see flashes of mm-hmm. this at Iowa State. Like, it's cra- it is crazy. Like, you, you you see them do great in their college career, and then we consider them forgotten. And then they go and do what they did at college on an NFL yeah. field. And it's like, well, I guess we had seen some <laughs> like of this. Maybe we should have known. Maybe we should have. Maybe just, I don't know, take it for what its true face value was. I want to get more into that coming up next. We will have more of the show for you here on Herd Out Sports Radio. Welcome back to Herd Out Sports Radio here on AM590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. I'm Robbie Lula, Avery Howard with me today, and we are halfway through our show here on a Monday. Hope you're enjoying your commute, maybe your first few hours at work on the day, whatever it is. Maybe it's maybe you're maybe you're working bank hours. You got this Columbus Day off. Oh. Lucky you. Wouldn't uh wouldn't wouldn't be honest if I was say I wasn't a little jealous, but uh, whatever you're doing, it's a good time to get over to the beanery. It's 8.30, still need that morning cup of coffee. They've got four area locations, Gretna, Papillion, Ashland, and a new location off of 168th and Giles. They've got a coffee truck that you can email them about, info at thebeanerycoffee.com. They roast their own coffee, locally owned and operated. They offer everything from, you're, you're, you're a hot coffee person? Actually, I'm usually an ice coffee. Okay, I thought I saw you rocking the hot well, coffee. Well, I'm trying today. to mature a little bit and be <laughs> smart, you know. So <laughs> you're like, it's cold outside. Yeah, I shouldn't I, be also yeah. drinking iced coffee. Yeah. Um. Don't let anybody tell you that. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that it's it's not okay to drink iced coffee. Oh, believe me, I know. But then what happens is then I like really get upset with myself, and I'm like, just drink the hot coffee. You'd really be thankful because then I'm holding it and like. Well, whatever kind of coffee yeah. you're into, hot, iced, they've got frozen specialty drinks. they got a little bit of breakfast for you as well. Check out our friends at The Bre- the Beanery <laughs> Serving People Coffee. You know, I yeah, I'm an iced coffee guy all I the way. I love iced coffee. I really have a hard time with hot beverages. I do too because then I have to wait for them to cool down and then it's like I got to chug them because then they're like kind of lukewarm. <laughs> you can't have it. Yeah. You can't like, have that's it. That's why uh, there's this much coffee left in my drink all the time right? because now it's not warm. Yeah, you're like, I, I can't mean, I didn't choose it. the right cup today, but still. You're like, it's not cold, but it's not warm. Yeah. You're, Nobody you're can in do that. No man's yeah. land here. Uh, that's right, Bo. Bo always has great life Bo advice knows, for us. Right? Is that one that was? Bo knows. <laughs> Whatever the hell it is. Different yeah. Bo, but yes, yeah. <laughs> Bo does know. It was on a Husker shirt for a long time. It was. I uh, do you know where the original is from? It's from. So it's Bo Jackson. <laughs> Okay, you know, that was actually my guess, but then you, then you really made me second guess when you gave me the look, and I was like, well, now if I say the wrong answer, now I'm kind of like, you know. No, it's okay. Those commercials yeah. came out uh, at least 10 years before you were born, so you're okay. Like when? Like 1990? Uh, like early 90s, I think. Okay, Late 80s, early 90s. Better. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it was a, because obviously Bo Jackson was doing yeah. a dual sport thing. So I was, go- yeah, okay. So it was these, I think they were Nike too. commercials okay. where it's like, Bo knows, and then it was like yeah. all these different sports. Yeah, and so it was like Bo knows tennis, yeah. Bo knows basketball, Got Bo it. knows so. auto racing. There mm-hmm. you can see Shane knows because yeah. he's even older than I am. Yeah. So yeah, that um, was definitely my guess. But then when you kind of gave me like, do you really know? And I was like, oh no, maybe I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. So no, it's okay. You know, the mean... more you know. <laughs> exactly. And he's like, Bo knows Tour de France. Yeah. That's yeah. He had the little bike and everything. Okay. Well, and Shane was a Raiders fan, so he's got he's got, he's all about the Bo Jackson. <laughs> Hey, they play tonight, though, right? They play tonight. Yeah, that could be fun. The Devontae Adams revenge game. Yeah. Is that what you the... don't point the finger. You... <laughs> Bo knows. Oh, yeah. um, I wanted to get back into that conversation we were having a little bit earlier about kind of this idea of having these guys in on your team or in your room that are just way better than you realize. Whether it's Brock Purdy, who's, I mean... He's got to be an MVP candidate at this point. He is right now. They he's, talked about it today. Yeah. He's a he's playing the position as well as anybody in the league right now. Obviously, he's, I'm not putting him in the category of like Mahomes and guys like that, but as far as how he's playing this year, and he's got a lot of help, don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah. But it gets really easy to forget that he, like a less, I mean, basically a year ago exactly, Trey Lance was the starter mm-hmm. who 
couldn't even get in in garbage time yesterday for the Cowboys. But Trey Lance was a starter Oof. who they had drafted third overall yeah. and moved heaven and earth to get to that third overall pick. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, who had taken them to a Super Bowl, but I don't think anybody was ever like, oh, yeah, Jimmy Garoppolo, that's our guy. They didn't win, by the way. They did not win. I'm I'm aware. I was I was okay. watching. Thank cool. you for that. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Um, Parade was really cool. <laughs> Sorry, continue. Uh, all right. We're going to have a hard time this morning. Um, <laughs> you have Jimmy Garoppolo, and then you got Brock Purdy, right? Brock Purdy wasn't even the next guy up. Yeah. He had to wait for Trey Lance to get hurt, Jimmy Garoppolo to get hurt, and then he got his chance. Mm-hmm. And I've said this before, but Kyle Shanahan is one of the better offensive. I mean, he's, he's top two or three offensive minds in the game. And that's being conservative, like maybe like, like Andy, who? maybe Andy Reid. Yeah. I think you put Andy Reid up there. Um, I give Mike McDaniel the spot behind Shanahan since he learned under Shanahan. I'm going to give uh, Shanahan the nod there. But I mean, if you really press me on it, I'd say no lower than two. If you my preference, I probably put him ahead of Andy Reid, but okay. body of work. Andy Reid's is better, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. obviously. Right. So. Um, but I mean, he's one of the top offensive minds in the game and he had all three of these guys in the same room and he's like, yeah, Brock Purdy's third that like, that's, that's a real thing that happened. And so I get fascinated by this concept, right? Because, you know, you've got guys, you know, you want to go different sports. You've got guys like, I mean, the whole Jeremy Lin thing, right? He ended up not being a superstar, but you had this guy on your bench in New York and then all of a sudden he rules the NBA for two weeks and you're like, how did, what happened there? right yeah it's like this guy nobody had heard of played in the ivy league or you have guys like you know i'll go back to teams i like you know david ortiz when he signed with the red sox in 03 he was a nobody nothing free agent from minnesota Mm -hmm. he'd never hit more than 20 home runs in a year had only played like two full seasons out of his first five or six he was a nothing signing nobody made anything about it and then he gets to boston and in the next five years he's top five in the al mvp every single year Mm -hmm. So you have these guys that just everybody knows they exist. Everybody knows they're out there and nobody thinks anything of them. And then all of a sudden, I mean, Kurt Warner's a great example. He was a nobody, nothing quarterback. He was behind Trent Green and they were terrified to have to play him. And then Trent Green goes down and they're like, well, I guess we're going to go with Kurt Warner and they go win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And he goes and is the NFL MVP. Mm -hmm. And then he goes and takes another team to the Super Bowl and ends up in the Hall of Fame. Like, I don't. There's a part of me that I just, I would love to be in some of those rooms. Mm -hmm. And then I have this horrifying thoughts like, okay, I've been in some of those rooms. Which guys did I miss on? (laughs) Like, which guys were on my basketball teams that I didn't give enough run to or didn't give enough enough time to that I'm just sitting there and thinking, oh, crap, what did we miss? Mm -hmm. And kind of the funny thing about it is you just, you, you never know. And I'm sure you, I mean, obviously you played division one sports. Like, do you remember anybody on your teams or just growing up or playing against people that you're like, man, I think they're way better than maybe yeah. they get credit for. Um, You know, I will say that like being in the middle ground is really hard as an athlete. Like you start some games and I mean, this is a little bit different than Brock pretty situation, but he, in a way he, he understands this. Like he's, st- he was the starting guy in college and mm-hmm. he was the guy for and like 35 38 starts something like that yeah yep, had all, like had great numbers like I, I read off all of his or not read off but looking at all of his honors and awards throughout college it's a long list and then you go to an nfl where you're the third guy and maybe you know being drafted last he kind of was like i have nothing to lose and also like i'm happy to be here i'm ready to prove myself but when you're in that middle ground, it's like really hard because one day you have the belief of a coach that's giving you a chance, but it's not the full belief that they give like their starter, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, he believes in me enough to give me a shot. And if I do well, it was good enough for the shot that I got. Not I am good enough to be the guy. And so I think it's, this is an interesting conversation because also it's like how much do we lean into is I we can have this, maybe this conversation later, Mm -hmm. but how much analytical data do we look into to make decisions for us when sometimes it's just right in front of us? Yeah. Like this guy that's in the middle ground has to work. Not that I'm saying a starter doesn't have to work hard, but they are constantly, no matter if they had a good showing or not having Mm -hmm. to prove something 10 times more. Yeah. They're chasing. They're always chasing. And even if you had a better performance, you still 
aren't maybe as physically gifted you may not have the natural ability or you maybe do have the natural ability but this guy's a few more inches on you or something like that middle ground person is always working so much harder Mm -hmm. always and so i seem and i like i like i said no knock to a starter but it's just interesting when then they get this opportunity and it's like well he has been putting the work in like he does have some of the accolades like he has been here for a certain reason and that goes for a lot of sports but as an athlete point of view like it's frustrating but it's incredibly rewarding We'll pick this conversation up coming up next. We will wrap up our number two here on Herd at Sports Radio. We will be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. They, they play like a team. You're listening to Herd at Sports Radio. Well, they, they play like a team. 
play like a team. Uh, they're tough. You know, we, we went out Sunday night. I asked them, I said, was Sunday night worth it now? And they said, yeah, 100%. And I thought for the most part, you know, we had good protection. I think we're a tough, resilient bunch. We didn't like the way we played last week. Uh, we battled here. It, when, it, when it was going well, we didn't just relax. Um, again, I'd like to clean some things up, but I thought they attacked. Closing out hour number two here on Herd at Sports Radio. I'm Ravi Lula. That's Avery Howard. If you're having any sort of issues with a personal injury accident, you can count on the Dyer Law team to provide you with a helping hand when you need it. They'll go to battle for you the way Coach Rule was talking about, no matter what you're dealing with. Call the Dyer Law team at 402-393-7529 or visit Dyer.Law to chat with trusted professionals about your personal injury claim. That's D-Y-E-R dot law. Just a reminder, you can be a part of the show. Give us a call at 888-638-4876. That's the War Horse Sportsbook hotline. Uh, we'll talk on that hotline to Adam McClintock here in just a little bit. Get a little bit of a national college football perspective. It's a little funny because you've got the uh, the really hyped week of college football was last weekend with the really high-profile matchups and stuff like that. Didn't necessarily live up to the billing this weekend. Not quite, quite as many marquee matchups, but uh, ended up being a really good weekend of college football. Um, obviously had some crazy endings. I'm looking at you, Miami. Um, just I don't even like I have to say, if you're a Nebraska fan and I don't hey, think that didn't happen. Yeah, like I, I think we talked about this <laughs> off air. I don't think we talked about it on air. But if you're a Nebraska fan, like at least you have I, like I've tried to tell people this, right? like mediocre programs and programs that aren't at the, and, and Miami's better than mediocre this year. Right. Yeah. Um, they, they're that were undefeated going into Saturday, but programs that are not at the top, top level make these kind of mistakes all the time that it feels like only happened in Nebraska. But man, the way that Miami lost that game against Georgia tech, where literally you just have to kneel the ball. Georgia Tech had no timeouts. There was nothing they could do to stop it. No, like I was watching them talk about it. And I was <laughs> watching the replay and I was like, was it that? Like, what am I missing? Yeah. You're like, like did was I? Was it that simple? What like, am I what not am understanding? I understanding? Yeah. I've watched it literally three times, like on different programs. And I was like, <laughs> still confused if it was really that. Is that it? Yeah. It's like they. No, they really could have just kneeled and it was over. It's like, like they yep. do that in flag football. Like yes. the kids just the high school kids do it, yep. you know, the peewee kids do it. It's so. like, hey, we're done now. Thank you. Uh that's the victory formation. Just line it up. We're good to go. Very confused. Um, and then yeah, obviously, if you if you didn't watch it, my which I don't know how you wouldn't have seen it by now, but Miami fumbled because they handed off the ball instead of just kneeling. Georgia Tech had about 30 seconds, goes down the field, throws about a 40 yard pass with one second left to win the game. And at least that hasn't happened in Nebraska this year. Knock on wood. We're going to hope that doesn't happen this year. But my point is, first of all, it doesn't just happen in Nebraska. Bad, stupid things happen to college football teams everywhere. So I don't know if you take solace in that, but I do a little, yeah. right? It's not like Nebraska is cursed. Like college football just is weird sometimes. And a lot of times it's really stupid. Um, but also kind of going back to the conversation we were having before the break, Coaches miss sometimes. They just yeah, they, they just do. miss yeah. on whether it's evaluations, mm -hmm. whether it's play calls. And so part of it is, I think, especially the quarterback position. Quarterback position, I think, is the hardest thing to evaluate in sports yeah. because you're so dependent. Now, some people argue offensive line, and that's totally fair as well. Like, I, offensive line is really hard to evaluate especially when you've got these really big guys at the high school level and you're like i don't know if he's just bigger than everybody else i don't know if he's good yeah um that's a really challenging thing as well but with quarterbacks they're so dependent on so many other things right they don't operate in a vacuum they've got your offensive line you've got your skill position players you've got what is the defense doing i mean if i remember correctly patrick mahomes did not have a winning season in college ever like embarrassed to say this, but I didn't really know Patrick Mahomes before he came to. I don't think that's that big of a deal because Texas Tech was irrelevant. Yeah, like under back Cliff Kingsbury. On those, like looking back when you look, like okay, Patrick Mahomes college stats or whatever. You're like, oh, okay, like oh, his stats are or, bonkers. Or but, like just you know plays, like okay, yeah. yeah. But it wasn't like we were 
wildly talking about Patrick Mahomes. No, I mean, you had, you had if you were a big draft nerd, mm-hmm. you had people talking about, like, hey, he's got a ton of arm talent. We kind of like him. You know, people thought maybe late first round. People were kind of yeah. amazed that, Sam, or that uh, Kansas City traded up to get him where they did, I think, at 15. But this was a guy that did not do a lot of winning in college. Mm-hmm. They were pretty mediocre to bad under Cliff Kingsbury at Texas Tech. And so not knowing who he was or knowing much about him, they weren't relevant. You didn't, you shouldn't have known much about him unless you're a real sicko and watching, you know, like below 500 big 12 football all the time. And so you, you know, you've got, you'd like to look at a guy like Brock Purdy and be like, well, yeah, he won a ton in college and he took Iowa state of all places to a fiesta bowl and won and one most outstanding player and all this stuff. Right. But then you've got a guy on the other side who in Patrick Mahomes is one of the most talented and productive quarterbacks we've ever seen. And you're like, well, he didn't win at all in college. Like, yeah, he puts up big numbers, but everybody puts up big numbers at Texas Tech. Like, is this real? So it's so hard to evaluate mm-hmm. the quarterback position for all of those reasons. And so it's, I think it's really funny sometimes. I Sometimes I get really frustrated by it. But I think it's really funny when people act like, oh, well, if the coach said he was better, then he's obviously better. Like, you could you could make an argument that Jeff Sims is on the same level as Heiner Harburg. You're going to have a real hard time convincing me he is significantly better than Heinrich Harburg mm-hmm. in any way, mm-hmm. except for he's got more experience, mm-hmm. right? But bad experience isn't necessarily, you know, when you have experience being not very good, mm-hmm. like how valuable is that experience? Yeah, well, that's the thing, too. It's like... Ha- that's kind of what we were talking about at the end of the last segment, just like Heinrich has had a mindset of having to prove something for a very mm-hmm. long time. And it's not that Jeff Sims is, this is no knock on starters, this entire conversation. It's just when you're a middle ground player, even in the whether, recruiting. Yes. Like yes. when you've had, when you've either come from being the guy mm-hmm. before, and then you get knocked down a few levels, you st- sometimes it doesn't even have like, sometimes it doesn't even really have to, do with anything that changed in your play necessarily mm-hmm. it could literally be a coaching decision or an injury like an the injury. jeff seems it Simpsons is injury. and like sometimes when we said like the attributes go in favor like when you watch a guy move you're like okay that guy could be that's the guy when even the other guy might have a better some numbers on paper mm-hmm. so that's what i was kind of saying is you know it's it's hard to be a person that is good enough to get a chance mm-hmm. but sometimes it's just to see if they can fill in and execute, yeah. not enough to be the guy. And or, sometimes it's a, hey, can you just provide us depth to this position, yeah. right? And so that's a really hard line to walk because you're getting a belief and you know that you're good. Mm-hmm. But then subconsciously, you have started to believe, well, I'm good, but not good enough. And I'm yeah. only good at these at this time. So sometimes it's hard to play up to that at that point. Like, I'm only a filler here. I'm going to make the most of it, but I know it's not necessarily going to do anything for me Mm -hmm. so it is impressive that Heinrich has really stepped into this position and known that like you know this isn't just a temporary fix at this point like I could potentially be this person for a long time now injury to Jeff Sims or not Mm -hmm. but this is just this is such an interesting conversation for me when it comes to like just the looking at a player and giving him the respect that they deserve because of what they've given you versus just letting it be hey you know what they were good for this game yeah. Cool. We'll put them back down. Right. Well, why? Why give him a half chance if you didn't believe in the like it, seeing what it leads to? In the, and so I think to watch Brock Purdy also do what right. he's done is is impressive at the level he's doing it because hey, he got a shot and he got a chance and he had to show up big. But then like no longer is he working from this working from behind mentality. Like you have to very quickly shift to like, OK, I've proved myself yeah, like now I now. have to step into what I once was mm-hmm. and know that it's in there because it's it's really hard as an athlete to go from being a player that was the player mm-hmm. to then being knocked down and like having to shift your mentality like I'm going to grind to prove to you. I'm going to grind to show you this. I'm going to grind to mm-hmm. live up to this, even though people are doubting me to then being like, no, no, I have an expectation now mm-hmm. and I'm going to operate at a confidence level that I know that I am this like when you go from two different levels like it seems like hey you we we believe in you you got this you got the talent you've got the whatever like go but it's really hard when you haven't had those reps in that position Mm -hmm. when you know like yeah i'm I'm that good or i deserve this or i and i shouldn't say many athletes are like i deserve to do but like when you work that hard but it's a conviction in your ability yeah like you have to start speaking to yourself that way instead of being like hey this is your only shot like Mm -hmm. make the most of it like it's it's a big mindset shift well and it's you know I think there's some advantage when 
the injury, whether it's to Jeff Sims, the high ankle sprain, or you want to go back to Brock Purdy, mm-hmm. is a little bit longer term. So it's like, hey, you're going to get three, four games minimum, no matter what. Like, we don't have a choice here, right? And I think that can instill some confidence where it's like, hey, like, this is my shot. Because if you come in for a series here or there, I mean, how much can you really prove, mm-hmm. right? Even a game, mm-hmm. how much can you really prove? But when you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to get a couple shots here. I'm going to get a, an extended look to show what I'm about. To me, that is a really impressive thing to be able to take advantage of, whether it's Heinrich Harburg, whether it's Brock Purdy, because it, you do go from this, hey, this underdog mentality, you know, I'm, I'm not from one of the big schools or I wasn't a highly rated recruit or, you know, like Heinrich Harburg was, didn't have a lot of offers coming out of Kearney Catholic, was you know, kind of a, a mid, mid-star mid recruit. Jeff Sims was very highly touted mm-hmm. coming out of high school. He chose to go to Georgia Tech, but he had just about everybody under the sun wanted Jeff Sims mm-hmm. as a quarterback. And so they came from very different places. Um, you know, Jeff Sims pretty much started right away mm-hmm. as a true freshman quarterback at Georgia Tech. And Heinrich Harburg was basically totally forgotten by the last staff mm-hmm. and was ready to come play tight end for the new staff. Like, they come from such different mindsets yeah. that it is it, it goes to that thing you're talking about about being a grinder and always striving towards that spot. Mm-hmm. Um, coming up next, we will talk to our friend Adam McClintock, get a overview of that big college football weekend that we just came off of and see some of his coaching analytics and what they're telling us. Maybe about that Mario Cristobal decision. Uh, I can't imagine that graded out well. Uh, we'll have all that and more here in the last hour on Herd at Sports Radio. Yep. We will be back. We will be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. Take 
and lifts. He stuffed the ball in just as he went over the ref. Touchdown, Jackets! Touchdown, Jackets! One second. in. Yeah, he did. He stuffed. Welcome to Hurt at Sports Radio. Caleb will want to run it in if he can, but he dives, and I think he got in. Yep, he did. He stuffed the ball in just as he went over. The referees call it a touchdown. Five seconds to go. He will toss it into the end zone at the five. Larry into the end zone. Touchdown, Jackets. Touchdown, Jackets. One second left. Question, Larry. Welcome back. Kicking off our number three here on Herd Out Sports Radio. We're on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, and now KFOR in Lincoln. I'm Ravi Lula, Avery Howard with me uh, today, and we are joined now by our friend Adam McClintock. He is the college football professor, and he is a, the founder of Matrix Analytical, the college football analytical uh process there uh, adam how are you this morning good how are you guys doing we are doing terrific i love the uh mini helmet wall you got going on <laughs> behind you there um this might be too granular and i don't know if your your coach's analytics uh go on this by a play-by-play basis but as you're watching this this Miami Georgia Tech thing play out, just what's going through your head, whether it's through your through your models or not, just you as a person, what's going through your head as you're watching that happen? Well, first off, you know um, we don't grade every play quite like that, but what was going through my head was, oh my gosh, this is happening to Mario again yeah. because it happened to him in 2018 when when uh, he did the same thing against Stanford, I believe. And Stanford recovered the ball, kicked a, kicked a field goal, went to overtime and beat him there too. So, yeah, to happen to a coach twice in their career, that's rough. That is rough. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm sure he's he's uh, he's got his head buried in, in the next week already. He's trying to flush that one quickly. Yeah, we we were discussing that earlier. We were like, were, were, were we missing something? Like, watching it over and over again, like, it couldn't have been that simple, right? Like, we were like – waiting for the reasoning as to why we couldn't figure out why I'm sure the rest of the nation was having that question as they watched that. But anyway, yeah. like as I guess we'll never know, um, <laughs> uh, looking to a different conversation, we were discussing quarterback situation like here in Nebraska with Heiner Carberg and also out in with the 49ers and Brock Purdy and how quarterbacks are evaluated and sometimes finding talent within your program that you might have not realized was there because maybe we're looking at analyticals more than talent or we're looking at talent more than analyticals. Do you think we've gotten to a point where just grading quarterbacks has become so difficult by the numbers or should we just take things at face value for what we're seeing? That's that's interesting. Um, grading quarterbacks is difficult. Is it's, it's very difficult. And actually – my partner uh, who uh, co-founded the Matrix Analytical with me, he actually has a, a process where he, um, his name is Dave Bartu. And if you follow him, he actually, when Brock Purdy came out of the draft, he had had him as, as one of the higher quarterback picks for that draft. He has a, a, uh, a very good way of, of looking at quarterback evaluation differently. And the way he does it is he looks, okay, what is a quarterback doing um, with with the talent he has relative to the talent he's facing? So a quarterback like like Brock Purdy, who was at Iowa State, elevated that program by himself for his four years while he was there. Um, you would, in his system, you would take somebody like that higher than, than you would somebody that say like, um, oh, Baker Mayfield, okay? Mm-hmm. 
because Baker Mayfield, they, the, Oklahoma was good before he got there. Yeah, he he took them to a maybe a little higher level, but Oklahoma was going to be good whether he was there or not. Mm-hmm. They had Lincoln Riley as the offensive coordinator. They had, you know. Oh, I think that that really didn't. Did we lose Adam? Okay, I think we might have lost Adam in the stream there. Um, you hear me? There you go. Oh, I think you're bit. back. Okay. Good. There we yeah, go. You're good. Yep. yep. Okay. So you were talking about the uh, ability of a quarterback to raise the talent level of their team versus quarterbacks in other positions, uh, kind of using historical uh, models mm-hmm. of Brock Purdy versus Baker Mayfield. Is there uh, guys this year that you're looking at um, that either you or Dave or, or your your matrix analytical model are looking at and saying, hey, this guy is raising his team's ability more than maybe we realize, a guy that's overachieving to a degree that we're not necessarily appreciating? Uh, yeah, there's a couple off the top of my head. Um, uh, Cam Ward out at Washington State mm-hmm. is is doing that right now, as, as well as uh, Riley Leonard at Duke. Those are two names that have really come up between me and Dave in the last few weeks. Of hey, these guys aren't getting all the pub that, that some of these, you know, Drake May and and Caleb Wood, Caleb Williams and some of the, the the more prominent names out there are, but they are really raising the profile of, of their programs above what they typically are. Um, so those are two names really to watch in this upcoming draft. Is there on the other side of that? Is there a guy or a couple of guys that maybe are getting a lot of the hype that your model show? Hey, maybe not raising their teammates' level as much as as we're giving them credit for. Um, this is, this might shock a few people, maybe, but um, Caleb Williams, I think he's good. Don't get me wrong. I think he's 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 very very talented. I'm not saying he's going to be a bust, but he may not be that. You know, and this is your word, Robbie, generational talent. Yeah. <laughs> Pays attention to that conversation. Yeah. Uh, he, might, he may not be the generational talent that people are making him out to be just because of where he's at, the talent he's surrounded with, and his offensive coordinator. Since we're on this quarterback question um, topic of conversation and just recency, I guess, of the Texas Oklahoma game, what do you think um, – college football saw from Dylan Gabriel this past weekend. And do you feel like he's been talked about at the degree? Maybe he deserves your hat just maybe not as much as you thought he would. Well, definitely Oklahoma has taken a few steps, steps forward from this year to last year. Um, I think that rivalry game is really hard to pick anything out of specifically just because of the, 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 the heat in that rivalry, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but yes, uh, Dylan Gabriel has, really brought his profile up a lot this year. That Oklahoma offense has improved. Oklahoma as a team has improved. But I think a lot of that may be due to Brent Venables coming in and taking back over the defense. Uh, I think we've seen a more so on the defensive side of the ball, uh, Oklahoma has, has really taken leaps and bounds this year. Um, but Dylan Gabriel, he, he isn't making some of the mistakes he did last year, be it that maybe this is a second year in, you know, in, in, in at Oklahoma in that system, he's more familiar with what's being asked of him and maybe actually more, more familiar with the teams he's, he's facing as well. Gabriel didn't play in that Texas game last year. He got hurt right. early on. Yep. Um, so we don't really know exactly what he would have done, you know, to, 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 to compare it to actually. So uh, we're talking with Adam McClintock, college football professor. Adam, uh, let's go a little bit a wider scope here with some of the teams that we've seen so far this year. Um, you know, it was, a popular narrative, to, you know, myself included, that Georgia had maybe taken uh, a little bit of a step back this year. It seems like with their performance against Kentucky, they they seem to be doing just fine. Um, you know, there was a lot of consternation with Alabama with an early loss, but they seem to be getting on track as well. Um, and then you have teams like Texas, who I thought maybe could have been the best team in the country um, from what how we'd seen them play early. Uh, and then they take a loss to Oklahoma. Who are you looking at as kind of some of the teams that are really are the best teams in the country? Is it is it the usual suspects, the teams at the top of the rankings that we're talking about now, or or who do you particularly like this year? You know, it's interesting to say this because they never really get lost in the fold. Really, they they it's really t- difficult to think of them as flying under the radar. 
but there's not a lot of people talk about Ohio State mm. right now. Yeah, you know, true. They have a defense this year. They are they they uh, per play efficiency wise, they have the second best defense in the country, second behind Michigan. Okay, mm. um, they played a tougher schedule than Michigan. If that offense can get on track, which we know the talent that surrounds, you know, that quarterback there, he's got the best wide receiver room in the country when it's healthy. Mm -hmm. If they can get on track offensively, Ohio State is probably the team to beat this year. Um, it's last year, the last couple of years, their, their bugaboo has been their defensive, their defensive side of the ball hasn't been um, it's consistent enough, uh, maybe physical enough. That's not the case this year, I, but from what we've seen so far. So I think Ohio State is one of those teams that we we have to remember. Um, another team that I think is creeping up quickly. Um, Oregon is playing very well. Uh, mm -hmm. Their their defense and offense are, are are matching each other as as, as well. Dan Lanning has, has brought that physical presence from Georgia to to Oregon, and and they're they're really playing good defense there, along with the offense we we know Oregon to play. Um, another team you got you have to look at Oklahoma. Look at the rest of their schedule. Okay, the rest of their schedule is. They, they basically had a one game schedule this year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, Texas, and then there, there, there was the rest of the leftovers of the Big 12. Okay. Now they're going to have to beat Texas again, most likely in the Big 12 championship game. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a rematch. Um, we'll see how that goes. If they can get over that hurdle again, watch out for Oklahoma because they are, they, they too are playing good offense and good defense. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, follow up on on the Ohio State here. You mentioned the you know if the offense can get on track a couple times there. As you look at some of your analytics with Kyle McCord, do you have do you have evidence to believe they're gonna get on track, or does he need to show something he hasn't yet so far this season? I think he's starting to get on track. The last two weeks, um, they they they've really started to hit their stride a little bit more. Um, I think. Early on, it was just a matter of getting timing down with some of those guys, getting you know some of those new pieces in, involved and trying to figure out what they want to do. Their offensive line wasn't physical early on. I think that's 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 kind of coming into fruition after the Notre Dame after the Notre Dame game and after some of these some of these most recent games. But Ohio State, they're 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 going to go as far as their defense is is going to take them. That's been the story the last two years with them. That's 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 what's that's what's going to that's what's going to carry them. Their game this weekend against Maryland was was impressive to hold that team to 17 points. Maryland has a good offense, um, and they were, were were stymied by Ohio State. That's something we typically haven't seen from Ohio State in the last couple of years. Speaking of just some teams that haven't been spoken about as much, is there anyone on your radar that you think is going to surprise people at the end of the season? Um, really, I think at the end of the season. Hmm. Watch Duke. Okay. Watch okay. Duke. okay. Duke. Duke. Duke's playing some good ball. Yeah, they 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 lost to to, to Notre Dame. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's you know I think that was maybe kind of ex, 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 you know expected there, but they they still had every every opportunity to win that game. Watch Duke if they can claw the, claw their way up the up the stands and find their way into the ACC title game. I think they could they could shock some people. Speaking of the ACC, how are you grading out Florida State this year? Obviously undefeated, kind of taking uh, what I think a lot of people expected, a leap forward for them. Um, have they been as good as, as their record would indicate to you? So far, it's, it's kind of a – it's kind of a uh, – uh, you're not really for sure who you're going to get at Florida State from week to week. They're not okay. as consistent as some of those top-tier teams, right? They're not as consistent as – as uh, 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 Oregon's been, or some of the teams I've I've, I've mentioned, Oregon or or um, um, Oklahoma has been pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, to me, Florida State is USC East because you don't oh. know they're you don't know what you're going to get them week to week. They can beat, they can outscore anybody, you know, or, or 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 they can come out and they can play down the level of their competition as well as we saw USC do this weekend against Arizona. So I would look at USC and Florida State and in, in, in a lot of the same lens there as far as what to expect out of, out of those programs this year. Adam, I, I'm glad you brought up USC. The defense is as bad as we think it is, right? Like analytically speaking, like it's it's every bit as bad as it looks, right? 
Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me because it, it looks pretty brutal at times. So one of the things I've always been curious about with USC, though, is it's really, I think, I think it's pretty difficult to play effective defense with the style of offense. It's not, you know, this isn't a Michigan where you're really kind of leaning into a defensive type football team, but, but it's not impossible, right? We've seen teams like high powered offensive teams before play good defense, right? So we're, we're kind of just been making excuses for USC, right? This isn't, it's not impossible to play good defense with that offense. Is it? No, not at all. I mean, look at Tinder Reuter. Tinder Reuter did, did, did it at Oregon a couple of years ago. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the, oh, I think we lost. Uh, Nick Aliotti played good defense. I think we might have lost him. Robbie, are, are you there? Oh, yeah, Kinda. I think we're there. Are we back? I think I'll remove him, bring oh. him back in. Okay, yeah, let's try and let's try and bring him back in there. Um, yeah, I guess the question I was getting to there is, you know, we we make a lot of excuses for like, oh, well, it's a, you know, with that pace, your defense is on the field a lot. You got a lot of quick scores and coming in off the field. And I get there's a different challenge there, right? And the numbers are going to look a little different. Yeah. Um, but we we'll, can try it again here. We'll let Adam get back into it with <laughs> the um, kind of answering that question about the USC defense. The, the, the raw numbers are going to look a little bit different when your offense scores that quickly and you pay that high that high paced of a game. But as you were kind of saying, there is evidence of being able to still have not just functional, but high quality defenses in those situations. Right? Absolutely. It's a, it's a totally different philosophy. You think of it as hockey. Okay. You got one line in one line out. A lot of what Tony white is doing right now is actually predicated for up tempo, up tempo offenses. Okay. So um, it's not impossible, but you have to pair that with a defensive coordinator who knows how to do that. For example, Jim Leonard, as great as he is, would not pair well with mm. Lincoln Riley. He's Jim Leonard's defensive range where he's the most efficient is between 60 and 68 plays per game defended. Where Lincoln Riley's offenses are demanding 75 to 80 plays per game defended. That's almost two whole more two whole more series for a defensive coordinator to, to, to do per game. So um, there are defensive coordinators who, who, who know how to do it. Um, Jim Knowles at, uh, at, at Ohio State is is one of those guys. Mm-hmm. Tinder Reuter is another one of those guys. Um, I think if you, if you heard me before, Nick Aliotti was really the first True. to 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 champion that style of defense when he was paired with Chip Kelly at Oregon. So yes, it is. It's a USC problem. It's not a. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to name names, but I think everybody knows who I'm talking about when I say it's a USC problem. <laughs> Um, it's a fixable problem. He could have fixed it before he went to, he moved to LA, but he didn't do that. So, um, we'll see how, we'll, see, we'll see how he, uh, how he handles it from here on out. But the Robbie, he's wasting a generational talent at USC, you know, Williams, right? You know, Certainly a college generational talent. <laughs> Be- yeah, but- right there. <laughs> before you go, do you have any fun numbers for, from Nebraska's defense that you've seen this year? Absolutely, Nebraska. Um, they have improved their their defense over last year by almost by almost seventy seven percent in per play efficiency. T- Tony White is the real deal. He's came in. He's done exactly what he said he was going to do. So when 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 Coach Rule talks about running defense to be the identity of this, it wasn't just um, uh, lip service. He's actually you know that's actually playing out on the field as, as we're watching. Uh, Adam, I, I'm curious. Did the anal- you get on the grass and play ball? <laughs> did the analytics <laughs> for Tony White kind of give an indication of this kind of success? Because with Syracuse, you know, like like I said, some of the raw numbers were a little up and down, a lot depending on how Syracuse matched up with their opponents. Did your analytics kind of give you an idea that maybe this was a really good hire with Tony White at Nebraska? Oh yeah, he was one of the he was one of the superstar hires that we were really excited about when when it, it was announced that he was going to be the be the defensive, defensive coordinator. We had him on a we, we keep a short list for our clients. Um, he was on our short list of up and coming superstar defensive coordinators who are mm. who are young, who maybe may not be household names yet, but they're on the up and come. He was on that short list. Um, as a Nebraska fan, I was really excited to see that they were hiring Tony White. And he has came in, he's done exactly what I what, what the numbers show he can do and, and what was expected of him. Adam, real quick before I let you go here, um, who are you showing in terms of just coaching 
who's done the best job this year? Who are some of the guys that have really performed well just from your coaching analytics that you're looking at uh, for so far, you know, a little less than halfway through the season? Uh, Mike Elko is doing wonders at Duke right now. Sure. Um, yeah. Love what he's doing out there. He, he he put together a great staff when he put it together the first time around. We were really excited about the staff he put together out there initially. Um, he's doing wonders there. A name that uh, uh, a couple other programs that people maybe aren't watching but are doing a really good job, James Madison. Look at Kurt Signetti. James Madison is doing wonders there. Okay. Um, also, uh, G.J. Kinney at, at Texas State. Nobody's watching Texas State, but – Go look at some of their box scores. They're they're doing some things there. They they flipped that program pretty quick. Um, he came in for an incarnate word, I believe, and it, he's he's doing some some good things at Texas State. Um, uh, other than that, that's that's kind of the list that comes to mind immediately. Um, trying to think of somebody else that may be off the beaten path. I mean, Jake Dickert at Washington State, but a sure. lot of that. You have to be careful with that because they have a guy like Cam Ward who's really, you know, we want to see when we, when we grade coaches, we like to see it past the, a four year range. That way we know it's not just one player sure. that is elevating the entire program like maybe Cam Ward is doing at Washington State. Well, what do, what do your analytics say about the job that Matt Rule's done so far? He's 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 right where we think he should have been. This okay. is, you know, you know. The models we had for Nebraska coming in had them at three and three this year. At this point in the year, they're right at three and three. He's right on schedule. Okay. That's what we like to hear. Uh, Adam McClintock, college football professor. Uh, where else can people find your work? Um, you can find it at Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash CFB underscore professor. Um, other than that, just, just Twitter. There you go. Make sure you follow Adam McClintock on Twitter. He has CFB professor uh cfb underscore professor excuse me adam we appreciate your time as always great stuff thanks guys i appreciate it yeah thank you that's adam appreciate you guys that's yeah. adam mcclintock he's a college football professor um always super so interesting stuff from him yeah. um as i kind of talked about when we were setting up the show uh, he gave me a little peek into some of their coaching analytics um so he's not going to give away the secrets right because he, yeah. he does this not just for a living for people like us but they colleges actually hire him yeah, to incredible. um to kind of that's what he was talking about with tony white as as yeah. him being on their list of of superstar coordinators um which is is kind of funny because i think a lot of people around here when tony white got hired were like who is this guy what is what is he doing mm -hmm. uh syracuse like they weren't that good what are we what are we doing here um but i think he's that shown a baller probably yeah. faster than anyone on this staff like yeah. oh this this guy can do it for sure at a super high level so really appreciate oh, i mean there's <laughs> oh, as even even if he does say on the grass all the time yeah, you see it, you see that at indy how'd you know that it drives me a little bit crazy iron sharpens iron there's one question i want to ask i'm you done next time. let's go let's yeah go. okay let's go um like what's the craziest stat that they can look at and like like they break down so many things and yeah. like what is like one of the things where it's like you would never think to pull that stat or like just what information does it take to pull like when like you know we look at yards we look at tackles we look at all the basic stuff right yeah. and they're looking at next level numbers yeah like what is the thing that if you told person like a person like we pull this stat and like it proves true or like I yeah, like my, the one that's like, like what the, is the one that you're like, like you a can big, track that one that's like a big indicator for success yes, that you're like, just like what on earth? yeah like i feel like in different sports when i look at the stat sheet sometimes like i'm like what even is and i'm looking <laughs> up i'm like they look at this yeah like and i'm sure they've got a hundred of those that are giving in these models but i would love to be like what's the one that you tell people like yeah we can we can track that yeah like, we can pull that and then i'd be like mind blown yeah like, I wait, you gotta know. get on the grass and play ball what are you yeah. yeah it's like what are you talking about yeah like you know? how, and, and how right yeah like what indication are <laughs> like get, uh, yeah. like how do you even collect that data on some yes. of those things right um great stuff there from adam mcclintock we love it when he joins us no uh, math class could teach you that no and yeah. even if it could i probably wouldn't have picked it up yeah um coming up next we'll continue here on Herd Out Sports Radio, on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, and KFOR in Lincoln. We will be back.
we will be back. We will be back. We will be back. We will be back. We will be back. You're listening to Hurt at Sports Radio. Here's a snap back. Zone read. Take the hand off. Harvard's got it. 20, 15, 10, 5, dives. Touchdown, Nebraska. Welcome back here on Hurt at Sports Radio. I'm Robbie Lula. Avery Howard with me this morning. We are wrapping up the final half hour of the show here. Uh, on a Monday morning, uh, tons of good stuff for you. Lots of football, uh, a little bit of randomness as well, which is always fun. Uh, speaking of randomness, it's time for the Warhorse Sports Book Sports Cleanup. Get to all the things we've missed so far today as we've been uh, focused on Nebraska, college football. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the 49ers a little bit mm -hmm. with Brock Purdy, although 
We didn't really get into just how dominant they were last night. I did not, not expect that score. I didn't either. I, I, I actually looked at it and like, there hasn't been many games where I've been like, ooh, Dallas Cowboys on a Sunday night. Like, yeah. good game. And I looked at it and I was like, I'm excited for this one. For sure. Like, following, especially like, you know, she's playing. So I was like, <laughs> usually kind of, no, I'm kidding. I don't always check out. But I was like, I'm looking forward to this one. Then I was like, whoa. And I, yeah, I, I mean, obviously I particularly enjoyed it. But no, I, I, went, in, I went into that and I, I kind of thought, like, hey, I think maybe I, I thought the 49ers were better. Um, and I don't think they're 32 points better than the Cowboys. I think some things kind of just got away from Dallas. But I was really impressed with how the 49ers looked. Um, so obviously I was thrilled about that. I thought they maybe win by like 10. I didn't yeah. think it was going to be uh, like that. Obviously, the late interceptions for Dak kind of got that thing away from him in a hurry. But you know what is a crazy stat? What's that? Brock Purdy has zero of those this season. Interceptions. Zero interceptions. Yeah. And I mean, career, he's got zero losses. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, technically, he takes the loss in the NFC Championship game against because he was the starter in that game, but he played, I think, one series, regular season maybe two. Starter. He's but he's 10 got and 0. zero. Yeah, started. he's 10 and 0 as a regular season starter. Zero interceptions. In games that he's played the entire game, yeah. he hasn't lost. No, like zero interceptions. There was this crazy stat that I saw. Uh, I'm going to bring it up here. Over the course of his 10 starts, he's the first quarterback in history for all of these things to be true over any 10 start span in anyone's career. And he's done it in the first 10 starts of his career. That is to go 10 and 0, have a 70 plus completion percentage, mm -hmm. nine plus yards per attempt, a over 10 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio and led his team to 1,500-plus team rushing yards in 10 starts. They're averaging over 150 yards rushing per game mm -hmm. in games that he started. No quarterback in NFL history over any 10-start span has ever matched those numbers, and those are the first 10 starts of his career. Oh, those were the first 10? Yep. Wow. Okay. He is getting it. My roommate went to Iowa State. Yeah. They it's, it's Touchdown! as she would say, it's Brocktober in our apartment. <laughs> yes, it's yeah, yeah. She, yeah. So we're yeah. on Brocktober mode right now. Uh, so just a little uh, Brock Purdy appreciation. I know we've talked to him, uh, talked to him about, talked about him a little bit, uh, just kind of in different contexts. But uh, I don't, I'm not sure people appreciate how good he's been because of how talented the 49ers are everywhere around San him. Francisco. I think sometimes he gets the, oh, well, he's just kind of a caretaker of a really good offense and whatever. And and listen, would he look like this in any other offense? Probably not. But, you know, Kurt Warner wouldn't have looked like that in anything but the greatest show on turf either. And like he still gets all his flowers. Right. I'm just I'm just still mad that you got you. Your 49ers still have my you, you guys have my play by play guy for the radio because he used to be that guy used to be the Raiders play by play guy. <laughs> and now you guys have him. <laughs> You you love your radio play-by-play -play guys, I Shane. I appreciate that about you. Um, some other things that we hadn't got to yet today, uh, some pretty big recruiting news in the state of Nebraska. Caleb Pifram, who had been uh, committed to Illinois previously, he's from, uh, an offensive lineman from Omaha Central, uh, has decommitted and has opened up his recruitment. So it's an interesting timing. E yeah, right, I was going to say, I don't know that it's a coincidence coming right off of that game uh, in which Nebraska, his hometown, uh, home state team at the very least, beats the team he's committed to. But um, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, you, you hope that Nebraska is able to keep him in state this time and, and get that locked down. But we'll see on that one as well. Uh, anything... Walk Bumping around on. your head that you, you wanted to... Uh, yeah, I mean, not that I know much about this, but there's a walk-on this morning, walk-on quarterback yes. in Nebraska as well. Yep, from Blair. I, I saw that from Blair, preferred yeah. walk-on quarterback spot. Still waiting for my guy, Anthony Rezac, to get some love from the uh, Husker coaching staff. Just putting that out there, you know, scholarships still available. Just toss one out to about 90th and Pacific, see what happens, guys. So I'm just Robbie's saying. daily dose of Anthony Rezac. You know, I was actually, I didn't talk about it hardly at all last yeah, week. Right. So yeah. I'm okay. I'm actually, I've got a little Anthony Rezac talk backed up that I need to get out yeah. here. Um, huge game this week, yeah. West Side at Millard South. I have to work hockey on Friday. Oh, and I'm excited. Like, yeah, I'm really excited for the season, kind of but I didn't know it was going to be on this weekend. It's like, I'm really, really, I was really looking forward. I love some high school football. Yeah, and that's number one versus number two in the state. 
I just uh, love the rivalry too. Like everyone's gonna be there. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk. I'll say there's been a little bit of uh, a little bit of chatter, chatter, chatter. little bit of chatter. Yeah. Um, yeah. especially you know on the Miller South side. I yeah. think it kind of was a few weeks ago with the oh yeah with the big game chain. Oh yeah, and uh, on our very own Herd at Sports uh, channels where. Uh, Millard South declared yeah. themselves the best team in the state. Yeah. Anna was like, hey, I have this clip. We're going to get up. And I, I literally think I sent back to the whole chat. I was like, oh, man, OK, let's be let's be careful. <laughs> let's make sure we monitor this one. It's obviously gone off on all platforms. But I was like, yep. oh, that poor kid. If it works out, fantastic. I mean, you appreciate the confidence, right? You like the confidence. You like the swagger a little bit there. But um, that's going to be really interesting to see how that game goes. Millard South is a little banged up. Um, they had some guys banged up at that game at Columbus this weekend. Um, so obviously would love to see both teams at full health, but I think still going to be a great game well, on Friday. Um, super excited yeah. to get out there. Bye week for the Huskers. I'm sure you'll see a lot of coaches. In the oh attendance. yeah. Hopefully we see some Nebraska coaches out. Yeah, to I have a feeling. And I think also too, like Anthony, to your point has shown a great showing so far this year, but it's probably fair to say this would be the real true chest on the schedule. Yeah. I mean, level. It, it probably, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy. Obviously last week was, I thought going to be a real test for them. Yeah, They went to number five at Carney. Shut like, them out. Yeah. Like it was 46, 56, zero? nothing at okay. halftime. Oh, and then they shut it down. Oh, I must've missed that. Yeah. It uh, was, I think, I must yeah, have seen like a score update. Not, I thought it was the end. Oh. I believe it was fifty-six nothing at halftime. That ended up being mm -hmm. the final as well. So you may have just seen the final okay, score. Okay. Um, but man, they I believe they, they held. They them shut it down. To yeah, they like they shut down. They like they didn't score in the second half. Oh, they, I was like, wait, okay, got it. Um, I think they no, held Carney to like thirty yards of total offense for the entire game. <laughs> so it was. Uh, West side's ready to go for this one. Okay. Um, so we'll see. I'm excited to see that one uh, between Millard South and, and West yeah. side. We've been kind of had that circled on the calendar for yeah, a couple for weeks sure. now. Yeah. Um, so that'll be fun. A lot of high school football uh, that we'll be covering is, I assume that's the big game of the week for her at. Yeah. I think the whole crew is going to be there. I like I think all hands on deck just say. to enjoy it too. It's gotta be right. Yeah. I mean, that's the, it's the, Short of the playoffs, that's going to be the biggest yeah. high school game of the year. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be super exciting. Super. Uh, Nebraska volleyball played last night. Yep. Uh, no, Saturday night. Saturday night. Friday, yes. Saturday. Friday, Saturday. Yep. yep. Um, I didn't get to watch, obviously, Friday's game because the Nebraska sure. football game. But yeah. uh, W and Saturday night swept them. So that's about just, all you can ask for. They're really on a roll. Like, looking at I, – I need to talk to Jacob about this a little bit more. I'm interested to hear his take because – it just feels like this team, like Nebraska volleyball has been within the top five, top 10 mm -hmm. every year for as long as I can remember. And uh, they were dominant, yes. but like not to this level. Like I don't have a doubt in my mind when I watch them. Like in the past few years, we've had really talented players, but I've been waiting for someone to like come up and set a tone and swing out of their shoes. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, man, I just kind of kind of waiting for like that aggression to set in. Like we do a lot of things good, but I'm waiting for like the set the tone mm -hmm. play. And this year it's like, left and right like you got andy jackson who crushes the floor and then harper just does what harper does and yes. then you have Merritt beeson who's just like this enthusiastic leader who also can like smack a like, volleyball monster right yeah. and so like they're just all over the place where i felt like in the past was like okay talented like good group this year it's like whoa they seem like they're on kind of a different page like a different yeah. level and you know what's so frustrating is the only game I really, truly, I love it. Well, Husker volleyball. I watch mm -hmm. every game, but the only game I truly, truly, truly care about, and I'm fired up for this year is Wisconsin. Wisconsin. You know what that game is? It's on the same day as the football game for Iowa. Yep. In Lincoln. Yep. What? Who did that? I I don't know. I mean, maybe. Who? I I don't know. That's not great. We don't. We're love gonna it. have a conversation. We we're gonna have to talk to some people. Uh, the first game with Wisconsin is coming up here on October 21st. We will see. We got Nebraska's got three more matches between then. You'd like to hope they're eighteen and zero going into that I one. I want to see them set the tone for that series and uh, maybe change the tide because Wisconsin's had their number a yeah. little bit here. Uh, coming up, we're going to wrap up the show with Eric Bailey of the Tulsa World. His Oklahoma Sooners have uh, been the toast of the college football world this weekend. We'll get to that next on Herd at Sports Radio. Wrapping up the show here on a Monday. I want to tell you about our friends at Dingman's Collision Center. They have 
uh, four great area locations. Best place, first of Om- or first of Omaha, best of Omaha, first place, <laughs> 18 years running. There we go. They've been in business for 25 years, family owned and operated. They can work on all your makes and models with the latest technology. And they've got a terrific give back program. Go to dingmans.com for more information. We are joined now by Eric Bailey, who covers Oklahoma for the Tulsa world. Eric, how are you this morning? Hey, I'm doing fine. How are you guys doing today? We are doing great. I have to imagine it is a much more pleasant time to live in the state of Oklahoma when the Red River rivalry goes your way. Um, what's the, uh, I guess, what's the attitude around Oklahoma this morning and kind of this weekend? Uh, it, it almost felt like the culmination of a turnaround from sort of a disappointing year last year to, hey, maybe Oklahoma's ba- uh, on the right track again. Boy, talk about a complete 180 in one year's time. <laughs> right. Uh, can you imagine what, just think about what it was like uh, the Monday after uh, Red River rivalry last year, 49 nothing loss. Uh, everyone wondered what the back half of the season was going to be like last year, and everyone witnessed it last year. And now Oklahoma 6-0, and ranked number five in the AP poll. Uh, Trajectory is going way up. Uh, should be favored the rest of the regular season. And undoubtedly, probably will get Texas again in the Big 12 title game if everything goes like as planned. Uh, Brent Venables has really turned this program around and just impressed. Uh, last year was a rebuilding year. I, I, you know, Brent Venables will never say that out loud, but I think that's what it was. And everyone's excited at Oklahoma. Uh, things are looking up, and uh, it was an re- incredible rebuilding job uh, by Venables and his staff. Eric, just being totally, I guess, honest here, how much of that rebuild had to do with the fact of how much talent that Lincoln Riley took with him when he left that job. I mean, that kind of has been a thing that's really changed the nature of some of these coaching hires than was way different than just a few years ago. Yeah. And I think that's it. I mean, he, when he left, it really took, there, there was so much roster turnover. I think 97 uh, first and second year players on this roster, this current roster, this has really uh, morphed into to Brent Venable's team. Uh, the, the, you know, there's just a handful of players on this roster that have won a Big 12 title, which is incredible. Do you think that when you think about that, there's not a lot of players on this roster that have experienced a Big 12 title. So when when Lincoln left, it, 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 you know, there's not a lot of holdovers, and that's what that was what Brent Venable's had to, to rebuild. Uh, when he came the first year, he was just trying to plug in holes and just find able bodies to try to to learn his system, learn the culture he's trying to teach. So it took time. And in year two, uh, you know, he went heavy in the transfer portal in year two to find, to to plug in those spots and and, and find the needs that he really had. Remember last year, uh, the first year, year one, he only had a month to really hit, 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 or really a couple of weeks before signing day to hit some of the deeds. Well, he, this past year, uh, he, he hit a lot of those deeds, and we're seeing the impact that those eight or nine transfer portal players on defense uh, that that fit what he wants to do, and they're making a huge impact because defensively Oklahoma is playing at a level uh, we haven't seen in, in, in over a decade. Of those big impact names or transfers, who has – lived up to the expectation especially in a game like this that may be new to them and just has all the pressure and excitement surrounding it who really showed up this past weekend and in one of those transfers you know we're seeing guys like uh maybe a young guy uh sophomore Dayson mccullough a guy out of indiana uh was thrust into a starting position at the cheetah role uh he's a guy who uh Oklahoma lost their starting cheetah to injury and he was really thrown into a position where he needs to play a lot of snaps and uh, he really does well. Uh, he did well this past weekend. Uh, he was the guy that did well. Uh, Rondell Bothoy out of big Wake Forest. He's an older guy. He played, you know, a fifth, six-year guy uh, that came in here, and he's learned the system so well. He was big. He played huge uh, for the Sooners as well. Uh, you, you just go around. Uh, Dejon Terry, a guy on the defensive line from Notre Dame, uh, he had a huge play in the fourth quarter. Uh, took uh, took uh, Texas out of rhythm on that last drive. There's a lot of players that have came in and just made huge plays. Guys playing in their first OU Texas game that made impacts. Uh, they didn't know what to expect. They were older players, played on different levels, different games. Uh, they came in and they made big plays of this that 
uh, really sealed the win for the Sooners on Saturday. We're talking with a Eric Bailey of the Tulsa world. He covers Oklahoma. You know, you're talking about guys that are playing in their first OU Texas game. One of those guys, despite starting most of last year, was Dylan Gabriel, who was not available for the Texas game last year. It seems like even though he was pretty good last year for Oklahoma, it seems like he's taken his game to an even higher level this year. What's it been like watching his development from year one to year two uh, at Oklahoma? Extremely mature guy. I mean, here's a guy who started his career at UCF with Jeff Levy, uh, OU's current offensive coordinator. So there was that relationship there. You just wondered when the carryover would really hit its stride at Oklahoma. They worked together last year, uh, you know, and had their ups and downs last year as they tried to recreate what they did at UCF. And now we're seeing the productivity that kind of we expected at Oklahoma this year. And going into the season, a lot of fans here wondered who was going to be the impact players at wide receiver. There were a lot of names, but no one had really uh, proven themselves. And uh, lo and behold, there's a ton of people making plays at the wide receiver position. Uh, and Bill Gabriel has chemistry with a lot of those players. He has a lot of confidence and faith with those guys being in plays. And Bill and Gabriel, uh, it was funny. You never thought you'd use the word Heisman Trophy with him, but his odds – skyrocketed after this Texas win. We're seeing him number three, number four in the Heisman straw pose now. Oddsmakers have him really as a Heisman candidate. Uh, you know, as they keep winning, I think those odds will stay up high. And, uh, you know, who would have thought that? You know, being a quarterback in Oklahoma, you're going to get a lot of attention. You probably get too much credit when things are going <laughs> really good. Hmm. You probably get too much disdain when things are going bad. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, but I think it's, it's a tough position, especially after you're following guys like Baker Mayfield, Tyler Murray, and Jalen Hurts, and Spencer Rattler, and, and Caleb Williams. Those five quarterbacks, look how special those five are. And then when you're trying to follow those guys, this is a fan base that's used to outstanding quarterback play. It's a tough role. And uh, he, he did something that no other Oklahoma quarterback has done in OU history, throw for 250 and run for 100 in this OU Texas game. He did that on Saturday. Not even Kyler Murray did that. So he's really uh, – he, he's placed his name in the OU record book with his performance on Saturday. Yeah, I want to talk about that. The stats of this game are – pretty wild like even for texas they put up a lot of good numbers but on the oklahoma side you have almost 500 total yards of offense 81 plays like is that just the nature of this game or is that something that wants to be the identity of this oklahoma team they like to go fast that's the thing they they, they go fast that's jeff levy's mo he wants to stamp the ball get it going move, use tempo uh get the defense moving 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 and that's what they did against texas uh, the one thing Oklahoma has struggled with this year, and, and it's going to it's going to be a storyline the rest of the years. They really haven't been able to establish a run game, and that's what big that helped Oklahoma win is Gabriel used his legs. Uh, he, you know, he was just it was his career high with rushing yards. Uh, I think he had 113 against the Longhorns. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that he hasn't really shown. And uh, I think that was huge. And Steve Sarkeesian even said that after the game, uh, they didn't expect him to run the football the way he did. So I think that's the key. Uh, we always talk running back by committee uh, when, when teams can't you know, find an established running back. Well, you got to throw Gabriel to the mix with the way he was able to run the football. And those runs weren't all scrambles. They were designed run plays, uh, uh, some quarterback draws. And I think that going forward, that might be just another way Oklahoma is able to move the ball on the ground. Uh, now you got to be careful with that too, because you don't want your quarterback taking too many hits. But I think that that's something that Oklahoma may throw a little bit more, another wrinkle that they may throw in there, just to be able to move the football on the ground. So uh, moving forward, that might be something that you may see more of, uh, just with the lack of just that that game breaking running back that they don't have on the roster this season. Eric, we'll get you out of here on this one. Uh, looking at the rest of Oklahoma's schedule. Uh, not a ton of world beaters on that thing at Kansas in a couple weeks might be the toughest one left on the slate there. How do you think they're going to deal with getting through this schedule without maybe looking ahead to a likely rematch with Texas in the Big 12 championship game? 
This is where it all comes to Britt Biddle of making sure this team's focused on a week-to-week basis and just making sure you're focused on what game at a time. That's such coach speak, but I think that's going to be so important for this coaching staff. You know, focus on UCF coming into town in two weeks, and then, you know, that Kansas game is going to be tough. And who, who would have thought when Oklahoma and Texas leave the Big 12, Kansas could run this league in football and basketball? <laughs> who would have thought that? No, uh, yeah, ho, ho. That, yeah. we'll, we'll not see I. what the newcomers say about that, Colorado and Arizona, Arizona State. True. Now. But who would have thought KU football and basketball? I think the BYU game is really a dream. Mm-hmm. That's yep. going to be a tough game. They, oh, you have to go to Provo late the season, and that could be a night game. That could be a primetime game. I think that's going to be a tough, tough bid you to go in and get a win. I think that, in my eyes, that might be the toughest game for Oklahoma down the stretch. But it's, it's all up to Lincoln Riley and his coaching staff to have this team prepared week in, week out to win Saturday, would go 1-0 and on Saturdays. And again, I'm starting to sound like a coach. <laughs> but I, think, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for this team. Don't read your press clippings. Focus on one game at a time and, and, and try to get into that Big 12 title game. Uh, that's Eric Bailey from the Tulsa World covering Oklahoma. We appreciate your time. Eric, we'll talk to you again soon. Hey, thanks for having me on. You guys have a good week, okay? You too. That's Eric Bailey. Appreciate his time from the Tulsa World. That's all we have for you here today on a Monday on Herd Out Sports Radio. We'll be back tomorrow on AM 590 ESPN Tri-Cities and KFOR in Lincoln.